Hello and welcome to the Mythic Dungeon International. We are back for our second weekend and our Group B teams. Last week we saw Group A duke it out and four of those teams will be going on to the Grand Finals. Echo, Last Hope, Dogs, and Legendary with Echo being crowned as our Group A champions. We are back though for Group B and we'll have the same situation here as four more look to move on to the Grand Finals or take home the prize of $30,000. That's up for our champion. I'm Rook. I'll be your host this weekend and i am joined by zironic nagara and tettles zironic this past weekend saw a lot of wild things i mean it was an incredible opening weekend not to mention echo getting knocked down into the lower brackets by dogs i'm curious what are your thoughts coming out of week one it was probably the most competitive opening weekend we've ever had in the mdi with strategies kind of uh going up in difficulty throughout the weekend at a pace that we really haven't seen before. Although, I've heard whispers of this particular weekend's teams being actually pretty unimpressed with some of the times we saw last <laughs> weekend. I'm not sure if that's the typical, mm -hmm. like, MDI team hey. sort of bragging deal, or if they really do actually have faster strategies. Remains to be seen. We've got three days of pretty cool action, and I think it's going to be even more competitive this weekend than it was last weekend. Yeah, I absolutely agree. We have a lot on the line, as you can all see there with the rewards. We've got our Group B teams as well. And I mean, like we said, the bar was set high last weekend. Nagura, we saw some strats. We saw some tech and incredible Murazon's Rise run from Echo. I mean, all kinds of things that these teams were putting out there. What do you think we can expect this time around? Yeah, so because we already saw some of these hidden strategies and techs that these teams came up with last weekend, I do think that uh, this weekend might become even crazier just because these teams, of course, now know these crazy strategies and they can iterate on them and improve on them even. Or maybe even come up with something that we haven't seen last weekend at all, depending on the affixes as well. So I'm really excited for this weekend. It's going to be a good one for sure. I mean, like we said, more competitive than ever. We've whittled it down from the top 24 teams to the top 16 this time around. You can see here our eight for this week, as well as our starting groups here with Perplexed and Bone Buds Resurrected. Now, Tettles, we talked a little bit about Group A and the stuff we saw last weekend, but what are you expecting to see this weekend in the competition? I kind of expect to see more teams for DPSing. So dropping that healer, I think, is going to become a lot more of a common strategy. So I think that that's that's kind of something that we were expecting to see. Uh, whenever we have like an information sheet, it seems like a lot of the teams have prepped, at least in some capacity, for DPS compositions. Um, so I think that's a big thing, how the teams are going to be able to adapt to that. And then just kind of some of the strategy stuff that we saw last weekend. There's a couple of strats, I think, like, uh, tanking Gnarl Root in the Water and Everbloom and the Echo Rise portals that were exceptionally good. And I kind of expect some of the teams to kind of adopt those. It's one of those things that MDI kind of builds on itself weekend over weekend. And the more information that is shown from the previous weekend, the next teams are going to kind of, you know, get an idea of what they should expect to be able to do, but then also kind of uh, expand what they think is possible and maybe even show us more interesting tech or strategies. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we for sure haven't even seen from these teams yet, right? You know, everybody wants to kind of keep things in their back pocket. They want to kind of keep things on the down low, especially for the grand finals. So we know that while here or there, we're going to get some really exceptional plays or some reveals uh, that there are likely a lot still yet to come that we have not seen. Now we're taking a look here at the match pool for day one. We have a lot of dungeons. We've got, you know, a great season three here. A lot of oldies returning that are favorites and some new ones as well. But I'm curious, given what we saw with week one, how do we think these dungeons are going to be different this week, Zeronic? Well, it's going to come down to things like the affix. Is, uh, affix changes compared to last week. And there were a couple of dungeons that were really not played too much last weekend because of the affixes and the key levels. Now, for instance, Waycrest Manor last week was pretty disgusting, right? We had fortified bolstering, which is never something you really want to play, especially in a scenario when you're trying to speed run the dungeons. And it was pretty much banned out probably like 80% of the time we saw it because of that. Tyrannical now, without really too many dangerous affixes. Raging can be pretty annoying, but generally they're killing the trash so fast that it's not going to be something that will really kill you off. But, I mean, that's something that I, we could see a little more of this week, especially with the Tyrannical instead of the Fortified, we could see a lot of massive trash pulls on top of bosses, specifically thinking about the Raw area. I, I think we can see some pretty fast runs in that dungeon. I think the dungeon we're not going to see very much of this week, as well as Throne of the Tides. Again, Fortified bolstering on that 24 level, it's going to be pretty difficult for them to put together a quick run in there. 
I'm whenever I'm looking at this map pool, I'm actually kind of looking at bursting, um, bursting mm -hmm. and Talzar, Galcron's fall. So those are two of the dungeons that were largely four DPS last week. So what does that kind of do to the structure of those dungeons? Um, can you get away with you know just dwarf and mass dispel and you still four DPS? Like how does that really look? Or is it going to be something that's a bit more? You, I mean, you have to bring a healer. It's a bit more technical. You see that Rester Druid popping up. I think that that's probably the most likely situation, though. But we'll see. I personally am really excited to see a Taldasar, just because the affixes seem a little bit easier than last week. And last week it was uh, tyrannical. This time it is fortified. So I think we can go even quicker than last weekend. And last weekend we already had a 9 minute and 21 clear from Echo as our fastest run. And I think it can be, be below 9 minutes on a fortified um, oh affix. Oh gosh. So really? I'm excited to see that. I think so, because the bosses is what holds them back on Tyrannical. Because if you pull all the trash onto bosses, the thing that dies last is the boss, right? So if the boss has less HP and you can do the same pulls, technically, then I think it could be faster. It definitely could. I mean, Ataldas are definitely one of those ones that we saw the time just getting whittled down more and more. Several of the teams seemed to be confident that that sub nine or sub 10, excuse me, was definitely possible. And we saw from Echo that it is. So absolutely here, we've got our bands for our first up with Perplexed versus Bone Buds Resurrected. Here in game one, they're gonna ban out that Waycrest Manor and Darkheart Thicket right off the bat, leaving us the Tall Dazar, then Black Rick Hold and Murazon's Rise. Zeronic, I mean, looking at these dungeons and what's been banned, does this kind of, does this fit with what we were thinking? Any challenges you think that await uh, these teams here? I mean, these bands make, you know, pretty decent sense. Black Rick Hold with these ethics isn't really too difficult. Generally speaking, when you look at dungeons that are difficult to run in the MDI, you're thinking about things like bolstering, like titles mentioned, bursting. And Sanguine is also one that's pretty difficult. Sanguine Dark Heart Thicket, where mobs are casting a lot of spells, is pretty tough to deal with. Especially when you consider the fact that Dark Heart Thicket's a dungeon where a lot of mobs like to snap around, and sometimes they evade bug out when they snap, which means they'll just peel to full through Sanguine. So, yeah, that's a pretty common ban, I'd say. Or maybe Perplexed even has an interesting strategy there, because, you know, we didn't really get a lot of chance to talk about the teams, that, because we actually had so much to cover from Group A and Group B. Perplex is a team that actually won the Legion MDI, a couple of their players were on Shell's Angels back in the day when that was, you know, when when Dark when Dark Ticket was first introduced into the game. So they might have some interesting strategies that they've just saved up literally from that MDI. So I'm really interested to see if we do see what their Dark Art Ticket is later in the weekend. But uh, yeah, that makes sense to potentially be a ban for them. We're going to, see, you know, if this goes to a game three, we could see the Murazons rise, which is something we didn't get to see a lot of last weekend. Yeah, I'm... Surprised that neither of the teams banned Mercen's Rise, because it does have Sanguine as well in there, and this is a dungeon we've seen banned by a lot of teams last weekend. Now, we now know this like special portal tech, um, but still, I feel like if everyone knows the tech, there's only so much time you can save there, so it's interesting to see that neither of the teams banned it. It'll definitely be interesting. I mean, it's are we're coming in here for game one, Perplexed versus Bone Buds Resurrected. This was one where we just saw that time getting lower and lower last week. So let's see how low they can push it here with these changes to the affixes. It's going to be a good one. Zeronic, do you want to take us into the match? Sure. I mean, again, so the Rise ban in like a three in a potential three game series is something that would make a lot more sense. But of course, we do have the highest seeded team versus the lowest seeded team in our first matchup of the day. So seeing a game three would be very, very interesting here. But we're getting into the match here at Tall Dazar right off the bat here. Remember our fastest time we saw last weekend was in the low nines, so can perplex potentially get even faster than that? Slightly different affixes, but We'll see how it goes. Slowly skipping past the trash with mind control here. Let's see where we end up going. All right, it's essentially the same first pull we saw last weekend coming in for Perplexed here. Everything stacked all together and the lust coming out from them right off the bat here. Bone Buds resurrected going for a similar pull, also pulling a pack of Toxic Swords in as well here. So far, so good for both teams and looking pretty safe so far. And one thing that uh, we immediately see, of course, is that both of the teams decided to play with that healer. We have the Miss Weaver for Bone Buds, while we have the Raster Druid for Perplexed, not running that 4 DPS comp that we have seen in Ataldasar. Bursting, of course, being one of those affixes where a healer can be nice, not necessarily needed if you have the Master Spell, right, on the Shadow Priest. If you time it correctly and you play well around it, then you can Master Spell it. But still, Bursting... If you don't time it perfectly, then the Master Spell is also not necessarily going to save you from like a double stack because of the increased the cooldown of it as well. There we go, Perplexed now engaging Priestess Alunza. Bone Butt's very close behind. 
uh, as they dealt with that first pull pretty nicely as well on their side. Yeah, I think I saw up to a 14 stack of bursting on the side of Perplex there, so that's definitely going to be a hindrance in terms of how the teams are able to move throughout the dungeon. The, the pull size can't really be too high because you don't want to start rolling those bursting sacks higher and higher. Once you use your mass to spell, you really only have the dwarves to back you up, and you can things can pretty quickly spiral out of control if your priest dies to something, so it'll be something to keep on here. Also, you know, for instance, on things like Priestess Alunza here, if you start killing off the trash at the same time a transfusion is going out, that could very quickly stack up and just kill a player in less than a second, so they really have to be careful about how and when they kill these mobs off. It looks like both teams are on pace to potentially kill off Priestess Alunza by the second transfusion, perplexed focusing a little bit more on the boss damage here. Have the boss down to 30% by the time the transfusion actually comes out here. Doing a pretty good job to keep an eye. Make sure those, bur those bursting sacks don't stack up too much for the transfusion. Looks like they're going to be just fine here, and the boss should be very low afterwards. Even dying, actually, during it. Looks like Boss is down for Perplex. Bone Buds do have their transfusion coming in as well. Uh, boss still on 12%. They're probably going to be able to finish it off before the next transf transfusion comes through. But still, a little bit of a time loss here for Bone Buds because they did not focus the boss as much as Perplex did on their side. And now Perplex moving on to, it looks like Rezan. They're going to be snapping quite a few mobs down here. We'll see if they also pull the middle pack. Keep in mind that it is, of course, fortified. Meaning that uh, the trash is going to be a little bit more difficult compared to what we've seen last weekend from Group A. Yeah, still still snapping trash down. Let's see if they're actually getting more down. Is is that mini boss pack from the center going to be coming down here in a second? Using a little bit of different positioning as well here, focusing more towards the staircase. Things are still snapping down here. They're also spawning a bunch of raptors. Maybe that's just from the trash running through, or... Maybe they're spawning it on purpose for a little bit of extra focus damage, but definitely making better time in this section of the dungeon than Bone Buds, Bone Buds Resurrected, opening up a 30% boss HP lead. Now, it is fortified, so it's not necessarily that big of a lead, but when you're pulling the trash on top of it, you actually gain a so much single target free boss damage at the same time. Doesn't look like uh, Perplex does have that many boss pack in here, though, so they're going to have to deal with that at a later point here. Bone Buds Resurrected do have that pack, though. So it's very interesting. We saw Bone Buds actually pull um, the double auger, double guard pack into Priestess Alunsa. So they went forward, pulled it, and then went like waited for it to arrive onto the boss. And that's maybe what caused them to be a little bit slower on that uh, pull. Well, Perplexed ended up not pulling that pack onto Alunsa, but now pulled it onto Rasan. So they have the double auger, the double guards, plus a bunch of sky screamers and raptors onto Rasan. While Bone Buds now decided to pull that middle pack. So a little bit of a difference in strategy. Both teams, though, only doing one single pull without a boss. So this is the third pull of the dungeon. First one big trash pull with last, then uh, Alunza with trash, and then Rasan with trash. So we'll see what they do here moving forward. We see the gateway already being set up by um, a shine for Perplex. Presumably Bone Buds doing the same thing once they're done with their side as well. Yeah, first up the dungeon coming out for Bone Buds Resurrected here. Chippy ended up going down to that Deadeye shot from... Dinomancer here, so they've used their battle res, also drift dropping down really low there, but able to keep him alive. He is running cheat death, uh, the real cheat death, not just the trinket cheat death. You can see he has that last resort debuff on his tar unit frame there. So they are expending a lot of resources on this pull with the mini boss, whereas Perplexed didn't snap the mini boss down to Rizan and also just skipped right past it here. So looks like they don't actually plan on pulling it unless they end up pulling it with, uh, with Yasma later on in the dungeon, but Still going for the same standard third pull that we saw from last weekend, where you're pulling all of these swords into the Witch Doctors and Shield Bearers at the bottom of the stairs here, and it's going pretty well for them already. Swords mostly dealt with, so there's no jumping AoE damage going out once these Bursting Sacks start to rack up here. And it looks like they're going to be getting through this pull, once again, relatively cleanly. Yeah, we've seen some of the teams last weekend attempt to pull all of this trash here onto Volkal. Um... But I'm still not sure if that was actually a time save for the team, because in, this in the first phase of Volkal, you have to split the damage uh, onto these sir, three totems to be able to um, get into phase two, to be able to kill a boss. And usually it's only worth it to pull trash onto a boss if you can focus the boss and cleave down the trash passively. But in phase one, you can't really do that, considering that you have to split damage onto these totems, because you cannot split the trash onto the three totems. So what the team did uh, was actually ignore the trash in phase one, fully focus the totems, and then in phase two you would cleave down the trash. But because it takes quite a while to finish off the totems and wait for the trash to arrive, it seemed to be not as efficient. You, they didn't gain as much time 
as you would usually see whenever a trash is being pulled onto bosses. Um, but Perplex now engaging some trash through the wall here with presumably a pet uh, or a spell that goes through that, um, the gate. So they're definitely going to get some efficient trash um, that they can deal with with Volcal here in phase two. Yeah, I think, yeah, I agree with most of what you said. I think it was pretty questionable whether or not it was actually a strategy that, strategy that was potentially faster than the typical 4 DPS strat that we saw. It does leave some some area for cooking though, right? Like, you know, what if yeah. what if someone was able to put together both the 4 DPS strategy plus those pulls so that they went a little bit more faster and more efficiently? I mean, the level of difficulty would go up significantly, but that's something that I think we can potentially expect to see for Global Finals if the dungeon level and affixes allow it. Something to think about. I mean, Typically speaking, the time spent between cups and, and the dungeon, fi the global finals is where teams really start working out those strategies here. Perplex though are able to get through third boss of the dungeon here pretty efficiently. Volcal going down for them. Seven minutes twenty seconds on the board as they start moving towards Yasma here. Shine has that uh, soul shard popped so we can instantly gate to try to get past the wall here. They still have 8% of trash roughly that they need to get here. We've seen teams pull swords plus a couple of skyscreamers into Yasma to get set for that. I believe we saw a player in the group running past to go get that as well. There's the gateway that we saw premiered last weekend to skip past the RP so the teams can get ready to go up to Yasma without having to wait for that wall to come down here. And we are off to the final boss. Bonebloods resurrected. I mean, all things said, it's a pretty That's clean run from them. Only one death, but, but just not quite as efficient. I think quickly want to mention one more thing that we did see Perplex do. We also saw some teams do it last weekend, too, where they all play Night Elf, except the mage, who has inv greater invisibility. And what they did with that is they pulled this trash pack into Volcal, We see Bonebloods resurrected did not do that same thing. So this trash pack that stands in front of the gate, that one has an honor guard in there, you have to kill the totem for it to actually, for, for the honor guard to actually be killable. And because you can't kill the totem through the gate, uh, you have no chance of actually finishing off the honor guard. So they all play Shadow Melt, and after the boss is dead, they all drop combat with Shadow Melt and with invisibility, and they leave that honor guard behind. Bonebuts does not have um, that Shadow Melt on the Warlock and then the Shadow Priest, therefore they are not playing the strategy. But yeah, Perplex, they're already at 35% uh, on Yasma. We are close to 9 minutes in the game, so we're not seeing a, a below 9 minute dungeon, but it's very close, and it was such a clean run by Perplex as well. They're still on zero deaths, very nicely executed. They have those Sky Screamers still left to finish off. It might even seem like the boss dies before the Sky Screamers die at this point. But yeah, just a, such a clean run for Perplex, and what a time. Yeah, this is a t this is what this team is known to be doing throughout the years, right? They've been doing it for almost six years. Divine Field is one of the most well-regarded tanks in the MDI, and his team has always been there to back him up. Still an incredibly fast run coming out from Perplex here. Nine minutes faster and 18 echo. seconds. Faster than Echo, like you mentioned. Perplex really starting off Group B with a bang. They absolutely are coming in, showing what they are made of. That victory here in our first game will go to Perplex whittling down that time that was already so impressive from last weekend. I mean, a lot of great clean strats. They're also great to see that they can accomplish this, even bringing those healers in, because, of course, we saw a lot of focus on four DPS, especially in Atal. Now, Tettles, what were you noticing as we went through this? I mean, I think that just some of the pulls that Perplex were doing. So while this pull, we saw a lot of teams actually pull this off last weekend. However, on Fortified, this pack actually becomes a lot more challenging. Um, Perplex has enough damage to kind of just brute force this pull, make sure that the silent sigils are going to be like the only thing that uh, is, is kind of keeping them from wiping. Because if the Confessor gets a cast off, if the Augurs get a cast off, it's going to become problematic. And that actually changed up their routing a lot. So we saw two major differences in the routing between these two teams. Um, Bone Buds Reformed actually pulled this mid-pack into Razan. Which on Tyrannical, it's not too bad. But on Fortified, it's actually pretty scary. They have a death to this. But at the same point, they were able to get it uh, pulled off and so I think this is actually kind of interesting that they were doing such different stuff with routing now perplexed was just a bit faster uh, Through the first area which I think kind of propelled them and then on top of that like Nagura was saying before we cut to the highlight package uh, Them just using Emma aura to pull the trash through the boss or through the gate Into Volcal and then group melding it off um, That's that's pretty big for perplexed and those are kind of the reasons that they were able to win it Although I thought Bomba's reform looked pretty good they they had one death, but it wasn't uh, anything unexpected. It was actually just like a 
Oh, I accidentally got dead eye aimed. Um, maybe I should have popped a little bit more of a defensive for that. Mm -hmm. Nigger, I know you were mentioning specifically some of the strategies with where you may or may not decide to pull those mobs onto a boss. And for anybody who, you know, maybe was just hearing a little bit about that themselves, or they aren't, you know, fierce competitors here in these top brackets, what do you think kind of goes into these strategies where they decide to do it? And do you think that really does make the difference even more so than just the raw DPS of something like bringing in four deeps as opposed to the heals? Yeah, so I actually think it's interesting uh, whenever you decide, am I pulling this onto a boss or not? First of all, I think one of the things you should be thinking of is what is the setup time? How long does it take the mobs to run to the boss? How long do you have to like line of sight for them to arrive? How long do you have to see them? Because all of this, like the travel time of the players and of the trash is something that you have to consider. And then of course, the added difficulty as well. Is it worth it? Like, Are you actually gaining time? To pull this onto a boss or not because if you're pulling it onto the boss and you have to focus down the trash because it's so difficult and you cannot handle it then does the boss even have to be there like are you just making it more difficult and you're not actually gaining anything so sometimes we see um even the teams disagree with pulls like these where some teams are pulling the trash onto a boss and another team does not and even though pulling it on top of a boss seems to be very impressive of course it is but sometimes it's not always worth it What'd you, uh, what'd you think about the differences between Meld and not having Dwarf here for a Bursting Dungeon? I think the Meld... I think it's so good, depending on like the trash percentage, right? Not having to pull the middle pack yeah. onto Rasan makes that fight so much faster and easier because you don't have to worry about the middle pack. And then you just get that extra percentage onto Volkal with that Shadow Meld pull. I think it's fine to not have Dwarf. Because... You have the master spell, you just watch it a little bit, and you have the healer, right? If you don't play a healer, then it's questionable. But if you have the healer, then I think it's fine to not play the dwarf. Zeronic, what are your thoughts taking a look at, I mean, we got to see all of the sort of stats coming out of that. We got to see, you know, how they kind of compared in a lot of their numbers, and of course, have a bit more discussion and evaluation. What do you think made the difference for Perplexed on this one? And just clean play. I mean, there's really not too much to go into here. The affixes are probably a little bit easier this week, Fortified. You can go a little bit faster, and especially in a dungeon like this where the bosses are pretty difficult. Um, and like, for instance, something that we saw a lot last week was when Trash was pulled on top of bosses, the boss was still like 30% when the Trash was all dead. Whereas this time around, we were seeing, okay, the Trash is you know still at 40% when the boss is you know almost dead here. Let's get some more cleave in, guys. You can kind of be a little bit more efficient about that cleave. So... It's just a little bit better in terms of damage allocation. Single target is generally the slowest point of almost any of these dungeons, so when you can pull trash on top of bosses and you can cleave it down evenly, you can go a little bit faster. That's not to say their time isn't bad. 918 is incredibly fast, but I would not be surprised if we can see even faster runs in that dungeon this weekend. Yeah, it does seem likely, given just how the timer keeps going down, down, down. Of course, Affix is a little bit different this week, but it'll be impressive to see just how low a lot of these teams can push it. Now, up next, we're going to have that Black Rook hold, which last weekend did cause some spicy problems for several of the teams. I mean, of course, we've had a bit of a shift here, but, you know, full wipes aren't uncommon in this one. And, you know, I have to say I'm proud of it, given that we share a namesake here. You know, not to say that I'm going to full wipe anybody's party, but sometimes, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but, you know, as we come into this one and we see our game two for Black Rick Hold, Perplexed versus Bone Buds Resurrected, we know the pressure is on. Bone Buds need to take this one or they're going to get knocked down to that lower bracket. So, Nagura, do you want to walk us through the action? Yeah, of course. We do have uh, one of the affixes here that can be a little bit dangerous. It is Raging. Raging specifically in Black Rook Hold can cause some issues uh, in the gauntlet when you have to interrupt um, that cast, otherwise they're spinning around or they're casting the flame breath as well. So that is something that we're going to have to watch out for later on. And then as well, these teams usually play these full cloth compositions where they run the Warlock, the Mage, and the Shadow Priest. And then there's a lot of physical damage in on the trash here, especially on Fortified with Raging. If you cannot interrupt the um, knife dances anymore, the shoots from the archers, uh, the barrages, all of that can be pretty dangerous if you don't time um, your CC right. Or are we going to see some evokers possibly? Maybe uh, see some AUG evokers for DPS or even preservation evoker to be able to deal with that affix possibly. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting changes we can see, but it remains to be seen about 15 seconds before we're ready to go into the game here. Black Rock Hold is a dungeon that 
you know, last week we were kind of surprised by the speed of the teams going through this dungeon, much faster compared to the Legion MDI five years prior, but, you know, with the differing strategies, the different scaling that we've had in this dungeon throughout the years, it doesn't make too much of a difference, I suppose. Actually, it makes a huge difference, I don't know why I'm saying that. But here we go, ready to go into the 23 Fortified Raging Black Rook hold here. Let's see what the strategy is. Pre and Viz pots coming out from both teams. No, Perplex is going to be pulling all the trash, not even skipping past the first, but here we go. Off to the races, almost heading just straight towards the first boss here. We're going to see that big blast of AoE on the trash coming out once everything starts to trickle in here, but they're not waiting for that. They're going straight in. They're going to be engaging out of the boss instantly. Both teams already in on top of the first boss. Yeah, and we do see the... Or DPS comp coming in from Bone Butts uh, with that Aug Evoker not running a healer at all, having that uh, AoE Raging Dispel though on the Rastered Roar on the Aug Evoker, while Perplex is running that Rastered Druid and no Evoker. So they don't, they don't have the mass AoE Raging Dispel, but they have the single Dispel from Sooth from the Druid. So very interesting to see that difference in composition. Now, because they have one extra DPS, it also looks like Bone Butts is dealing with the boss quite a bit quicker, and they can very likely also just ignore intermission phase here like these souls coming in they don't stand a chance as amalgam is already dead for bone butts in just a moment while the trash is still trickling in a little bit for perplex and uh yes uh, what a what a boss run here for bone butts with that bloodlust as well they still have a, a lot of hp on the mini boss though Burst is going to do a lot of damage. The boss ate a lot of souls there, yes, and Swag actually ends up going down to the burst there. In addition to the Glaive Toss from the mini-boss here, both of those happening at almost the exact same time combined to take him out. They're not going to use their Battle Riz, though, because once the boss goes down, he can just release and join the team right here. It's going to happen. There he is, right in the middle of the room, and they still have the mini-boss at roughly 30% HP. Now, yes, Bone Buds did deal with the boss so much more quickly than Perplexed, but Perplexed already has all of their trash dead. All they have to do is finish off the mini-boss here, and they have they get, they get to move on. And I think they're going to have a decent bit amount more trash as well. Bone Buds still have a lot of this to work through, though. Yeah, interesting. It really looked oh. like Bone Buds was playing a little bit safer did it faster. on Wait. their side. They did finish off the trash quicker, and the door is already more. open. All the same. <laughs> they have to say this. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it definitely looked like Bone Butts was playing somewhat safe by just fully seeing the trash, except the mini boss, of course, because that one cannot be CC'd, until the boss was dead and then focusing the trash, which seemed fine, though. Like, it definitely seemed like um, they have enough time to finish off the trash before the door opens, so they totally um, did make up some time in comparison to Perplex. And we can see the difference is 22 seconds on the boss split, though. It's not actually the trash split. So that 20 seconds is less, uh, I, th I think it's like more like 10 seconds, 5 to 10, that the Bone Buds did finish off that first boss area uh, earlier. But yeah, there we go, now we're in this area where we see a lot of physical damage with the archers, the shoots coming out. Uh, we'll see if Raging actually caused some issues for both of these teams. Yep, here we go into the pole here, Perplex getting set a little bit more quickly than Bone Buds, but both teams at a great pace burning this trash down. Most of the trash already dead for Perplexed, and they're just going to chain it. They're they're not even waiting for this trash to go down. Dividefield is off to the races here. Remember, no Sanguine this week. That was the major inhibitor last time around. They really had to make sure they didn't have mobs instantly die off in a pack so that a Sanguine pull would drop underneath the mobs, and as long as you're able to Keep control on the mobs. Don't let them get any of their major casts off. Chaining is going to be the name of the game in this section of the room this week. They're doing a good job of it. No deaths for either of the teams so far on this major trash pull. Doing a pretty good job. Perplex might just be going just a little bit faster with that chain, though. And you can see every single time one of these raging shots goes off on the team, it's going to chunk someone for like half their HP, especially these cloth range DPS. Take a ton of damage from these physical attacks. Yeah, definitely have to worry about the archers and um, the scouts. But then there's also a caster in there that has to be interrupted. Now, of course, if you're running that full ranged comp, then uh, you're lacking a little bit of interrupts. That's why we did see Luffer die to one of those arcane blitzes. Um, did use that battle rest and get him up immediately, so no problem there. Did manage to recover. Have to watch out a little bit, though, because they don't have another rest for six minutes. This pull looking a little bit better for Bone Butts as they finish it off so quickly. But yeah, again, raging on the... Uh, under Arcanists also means that you cannot use normal stuns to interrupt them. You have to use those interrupts, which they're lacking a little bit of. And I think we've been kind of so numb to it that we haven't really covered it a lot. This is the first time we're seeing the no healer run in Black Recold as well, right? We have that augmentation of Ochre for Bone Buds instead of the healer, which is going to give them a little more single target damage. But when it comes to just playing safe and ha not having a healer, you can see, oh man, 
That was a one-shot phased explosion coming up from the arcade minion there onto Chezizard, unfortunately. And they don't have that battle res, so he's going to have to run all the way back up the staircase to rejoin the team. You know, theoretically, it should give them higher damage percent potential on the trash and the bosses, but... You know, just having that Aug Evoker dead is going to make this trash take that much longer for them. Also, they weren't quite as adept at chaining through the poles as Perplexed was. As Perplexed is already on Tills on a Rivencrest and nearly have it at half HP already. Yeah, Perplexed definitely dealing with that trash area quicker on their side. Having that healer also means they can play fully offensively, while Bombats, of course, lacking that healer. They have to be super careful about their own survivability, and um, that will cost you some damage for sure. So, yeah, not being able to do those same big pulls in comparison uh, definitely cost them a lot. Perplex on 35% on Ilizana already, just blasting through this boss here. And right after Ilizana, this is the area that I think might be the most dangerous one um, for Raging Blackrock Fortified. So we'll see how they deal with that one. Maybe they even have to save some of their offensive cooldowns to be able to use them at the end of the pull to make sure that uh, they die very quickly through that raging ethic. Yeah, let's actually see what the difference in single target damage is going to be between the two teams here. I imagine it's going to be pretty significant. Perplex was able to take down Osana in a minute and 18 seconds was the combat timer there. Let's see what it is for Bone Buds here. 30 seconds at about half HP. We'll have to keep an eye on what that's like when they actually finish the boss off. But we're going to get our first look at this pull from Perplex on the left-hand side. With Raging and Afflicted, I think it's going to be a lot easier of a pull than what it was last week with Sanguine. A lot less mob management needed. The main thing to keep an eye on is going to be Divine Field. He's going to be taking so mu much damage from the trash here. These Blade Lords need to get soothed instantly when they get into Raging, otherwise a Brutal Assault could essentially just one-shot him off the face of the Earth. So uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that. So far, so good on the mob control there. You can just freely CC and AoE stun every single one of these ancient potion casts. But look at the HP bar for Divine Field. They're dropping, just teeter-tottering on the edge of death there, but now topped off from himself and Sevi keeping him topped, and with most of the Blade Lords down, I think he's going to be okay. It's interesting, because Sevi wasn't even there for most of this pull. Sevi did mm -hmm. walk up the stairs preemptively, uh, stopping the boulders from spawning, making sure that the team saves some time walking up the stairs here, because we don't have Sanguine, so they don't have to, to, um, to uh, drag the trash up the stairs to save some travel time. They literally just had to Sevi on that dresser Druid walk up the stairs just to save a little bit of boulder dodging time of the team later on. So just maybe like two or three seconds that it really saved them. But I liked it a lot. That is, uh, all of that matters, of course, in a speedrunning competition like this. And now they're gathering out all of this trash, immediately pulling Smash Spite as well on top of these um, Dominators. They have to make sure they're interrupting all of the Fell Frenzies here. Otherwise, that boss and the trash is going to do a lot of damage. But... Um, I think they should be able to manage that, as they only have those two Dominators, I believe, the other ones they skip. And I was talking about this before, but I went back and looked at the boss kill timer for Bone Buds Resurrected on Asana. It was, it was 124, so it was actually 6 seconds slower than what we saw from Perplex, which is kind of confusing when you look at a 4 DPS comp. They might have also been just saving cooldowns on the boss for this particular pull that they're on right now, which completely melted for them. Actually, Himo didn't even use the Infernal on this trash either. Didn't use it on Elsana, so he's probably saving it for the next pull, which is interesting as well. Sitting on that Infernal for quite a long period of time. That being said, they are still very far behind in this dungeon with those random spot deaths on the earlier trash really costing them a ton of extra time. Perplexed is just playing incredibly safe. The only death they've had in this dungeon was on the last 5% of a boss. They didn't even have to expend a battle res for it. They're just staying safe. It's really impressive play from them. Yeah, and uh, to compare the times here, now obviously uh, we still have to finish the dungeon for both Perplex and Bone Buds, but the best run last week in the Black Rock Hold was from Echo, 12 minutes and 46 seconds. It was also at 23.45, except we did have Sanguine instead of Raging, which of course might have been a bigger time loss. So we'll see if Perplex can beat that time from Echo, as they're now moving towards the last boss, pulling, out, pulling all of these Lancers and Swordsmen, presumably onto the last boss. Uh, that is something we've seen last week as well, even with Sanguine. So I certainly think they can do it without that affix here. Just has to be a little bit careful as they're walking up the stairs because these lances are, of course, jumping around and they don't want to get hit by that. And face one of this boss can do a lot of damage with those Shadow Bolts. Yep, again, got to keep an eye on Divine Field here. These mobs 
while not necessarily that dangerous right now, are more of a threat for the ranged players. When that bleed debuff stacks up on Divine Field and then he starts taking raging melees from these mobs, his health bar is going to just teeter-totter around a ton. Gotta keep an eye on him here for sure here. For now, good cleave coming out from the team here, but a lot of damage coming out just from the residual boss damage on this fight, those Shadow Bolts being thrown out of random players in the group. They're already through Phase 1, though, at 10%. The boss does phase into Phase 2 here, but here we are. Look at, the, look at Divine Field's health here. Two stacks of that bleed, still tanking all 12 of these mobs on top of the boss here, and it's only going to get worse once Dentalianax actually spawns in. And they're very dangerous. They, they, they are in a lot of trouble right now without the damage and health buff that this boss gives you. Once this first Shadow Bolt Volley goes out, Zebby's going to have to do a ton of healing on the group. And there it is. They have the buff. They should be home free now. With the Bloodlust, they'll be able to finish off this trash and burst down to Italian Axe. Yeah, that definitely looked very dangerous there at the very end before that buff was uh, thrown out onto the group. Divinefield just hiding around, using all of his defenses that he has available. And then another thing about Raging is that the Lancers cannot be interrupted anymore on their jump, which makes it additionally difficult. If you have a swarm on a player, you consistently get stunned. And if then a Lancer jump is on you, that cannot be disrupted because of the Raging effect. And that can cause you to die very easily. Um, that's why, presumably, they are using their defensives to just ignore or to, to skip that first swarm by using stuff like Shadow Melt. But there we go! Uh, the boss is Ooh. going down for Perplex so incredibly quickly, and they are winning that Whenever first series against Bone Buds with an 11 minute and 16 and seconds clear of that Black Recall, which is another new record by Perplex. Perplex is absolutely coming out here showing that they are not a veteran team without a good reason. They have a long, long history in Mythic Plus, and with that victory here in this game, as you said, Nagara, they're going to go ahead and secure their place to move forward. Well, we're going to see Bone Buds sent down to the lower brackets. Now, of course, it's not just Bone Buds, it's Bone Buds resurrected. So if anybody has a chance to res and come back and see if they're able to make it happen, I believe it's going to be them. Yeah, Tattles, do you like that? You like that? <laughs> but, I'm, but, I'm not at all excited that at all. <laughs> but, um, you know, Perplex, like we said, consistently ranks high in the time trials MDI Global Finals. Bone Buds a little bit more of the underdogs here. But Tattles, do you want to take us through a little bit of the strats that you were observing here in this second match yeah so bumbos is a team that we saw last mdi um with slightly different i think they have like one different person on their team um but overall i mean i thought they looked pretty good the fact that they were willing to bust out this four dps composition with aug and they killed the first boss off somewhere in the order of like 15 seconds faster than perplexed i thought that we were going to be in for a very interesting finish there was a couple of things in black or cold though that kind of hold you back whenever you don't have a healer particularly this pull this is where perplex really started accelerating their time over bone buds where they were able to take all of these archers into this extra pack and that's the, that's the advantage that the healer provides right you're you're not really waiting for the archers to die off you're not pulling the pa the trash pulls like one pack at a time instead you're able to just kind of go uh, and dive on into this pull and it has three archers in it which is incredibly dangerous uh, but with that healer you're not like super scared you're able to like kind of defensive through it and then just kind of get healed through it this was probably the last part of the dungeon that i thought perplex could potentially wipe with all these scavengers because they don't have a, a mass soothe but they were able to just kind of get this this pack killed off before that drink ancient potion cast finished and then you know perplex was able to kind of take it down like that that world caliber team that they've always ha they always have been Mm -hmm. I mean, Zyronic, this was definitely, I think, just such a clean run, perplexed in both of these dungeons, right? Coming in, showing that, you know, even though they have a new healer on the team with Sevi coming in, that they really are rock solid in this kind of composition. Do you really think that just having it down that cleanly, really pulling it together that way, executing everything to the best of your abilities is something that's going to be an asset for them over the long term in this competition? Oh, I mean, absolutely, yeah. Years of experience in this game is really, really important towards competing well in the MDI. You know, as we've seen with the just absolute dominance that we've seen from Echo for the past five years or so of the competition, right? Perplex has always been there with them neck and neck, only really kind of slowing down in terms of their, their competition in the past couple of years, but they've always been there, right? They've always been a team that puts up really fast times when they need to. And, you know, adding someone like Sevi to the team is really just, it's just a boon for them. Like, Sevi is probably one of the top 10, heal, like, rating healers in the world. The dude's an absolute animal and knows how to do damage, too. He, he plays Boomkin when it's needed for Liquid also. So, like, 
the guy knows how to min max better than most people in the game, and I'm sure he fits perfectly into the mold of this team. I don't know if you guys caught it or if viewers caught it, but they also uh, they melded Dentalian Axe before that first volley went off, and Zebby mm -hmm. melded it so late that they were actually able to get the buff before that Shadow Bolt volley hits. So most groups on live will actually double meld that, but if you meld it at like the last like 0.2 seconds, you're able to actually get that buff before uh, the second volley hits. Interesting, interesting. I mean, really, really good just performance from them all around. And like you're saying, going into some of those details they really thought about to see, you know, how they could absolutely make this whole thing come together and just perform so solidly. I mean, even in the time trials, we saw them only 14 seconds behind Echo's timer. So, I mean, they've really been cleaning it up. They've really been paying attention. And I mean, I don't know, Nagura, do you think that they might give Echo a run for their money? If they make it to the grand finals, you know, we'll say. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a few teams in this group that can totally beat Echo, in theory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, of course, the theoretical game. Ah, the theory! Hmm. But we always say that, and then it never ends up happening, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. But we also get to see something a little bit different, a little fun. You know, of course, we saw Perplex there taking it 2-0. Bonebud's going down to that lower bracket. But we also have a little bit of a, an extra fun game we've been playing here, the Dungeon Movement Maps, where we encourage you, chat, as well, to try to guess the Dungeon Boss based only on the movement of the players. Each replay here is going to show movement from competitors in a real match played in this season's Mythic Dungeon International. This has been a lot of fun. We actually saw this sort of premiere with AWC. And this segment is inspired by the movement maps that were created by Yaks from Warcraft Logs. So be sure to check out the weekly raid movement maps and play along on X, formerly Twitter, at Warcraft Yaks. Now, let's take a look. We've got four options here. I don't know, Tettles, what do you think this might be? Wait, hold on. Is oh, this yeah. from this? It, this can't be from this weekend, no, no, or it has no, no, to be no. from last weekend. I think right? so. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. I can None of those, <laughs> none <laughs> none of those this bosses weekend. are from this fast, weekend. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I could believe it's Deus, right? Because mm. you're going to that starting area, then you're crossing the platform, then you're crossing to follow the dragons. Yeah. Um, I think maybe I think it's far more little likely little... to be. It's far more likely to be Morchi, no? Because you're kiting around with it's the trash. Yeah. Oh, and then there was the, and then there was the port there it's at the Morchi, end. Yeah. It's yeah, Morchi. Yeah, that we... mm. Right. I it's think Morchi's a good bet. <laughs> I don't think it's awesome at Nazjar ever. I... Didn't they just do the mirror game? Like where are they? found the correct Morchi, and that's why they all walk so quickly to one side? Oh, maybe. Well, so yeah, they, they with, on Morchi, they kite the familiar faces, and they have the Farseers on the on the pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, that yeah. makes sense. Good job, everyone. Pat's well done. <laughs> Pat's in the back, well done, everybody. Good sleuthing. I mean, honestly, it's amazing seeing how they're able to trace all of the paths in this. Uh, so cool to see what you actually kind of have from a bird's eye view when you're in it. Um, and of course, this was all possible thanks to Warcraft Logs. So make sure uh, that you check it out. Log your dungeons, optimize your gameplay by using the tools that they have to analyze your performance. Level up by learning with Archon.gg from finding the best builds to understanding the meta. I mean, Warcraft Logs is a huge tool. If any of you aren't using it, get out there, go check it out. Um, and a huge thank you to them again as well for helping power this segment. Now, we are going to be taking a quick break as we set things up for our next match. But I mean, hey, we had our first ones, you know, up next, we've got Eclipse and Ducks Can Fly. I don't know. Zeronic, do you have any predictions about what we might see up next? I think we're going to see a series between two teams. One of them's <laughs> going to win and one's going to go to the lower bracket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seriously, I think I think, I think Eclipse <laughs> is a pretty heavy favorite in this matchup. But, you know, we've seen more. We've seen interesting, interesting things happen in the MDI. I mean, you know, we could see an upset. You never know. We could, we could, you know, we'll keep hoping for it. We'll keep believing in it. I mean, it's been great. The teams already have surprised us in so many ways. And hey, I mean, like we said at the start, we saw Echo knocked down to the lower bracket right from the get-go. So really, you never know when uh, they might fall. Although, of course, we all know that probably they will win. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we still have four that we have to get here for our winners this weekend to move on to the grand finals. We have one grand champion that will be ultimately determined, but we'll have a champion of our own this weekend as well, who will be walking away with $30,000 as well as a spot in those grand finals. However, we have more matches that have to determine that. So when we're back from the break, we'll be moving on to our next setup. Until then, sit tight and we'll see you soon.
Hello and welcome back. And don't worry, you didn't miss a joke chat. We'll get you into it as we all come in laughing here at the start. Welcome back to the Mythic Dungeon International. We have just started off our Group B weekend here. We had our first matches, which actually saw uh, Perplex moving on, securing a spot in the upper bracket, and Bone Buds resurrected, put down to the lower bracket. Next up, though, we're going to have Eclipse and Ducks can fly facing off against each other. And as Nagura was saying, before this who is eclipse i mean we've got who who is ducks can fly who are these teams no we do know a little bit about them so we'll go ahead and share some of that now dratnos has come in to join the desk so dratnos can you enlighten us a little bit on eclipse here so eclipse are coming into this series as the favorites for sure there are some names you may recognize here from high-end keys and from previous mdis kira aj krona uh so they've definitely got a, a bit of an edge here one of the teams that I think some of us are predicting to even make it out of the weekend, uh, although, of course, competition is going to be very tight for those slots out of the group, but uh, it's definitely a, a strong-looking team. On the other side, we have Ducks Can Fly, which is definitely coming in as the underdogs, although they've actually played, uh, I believe it was an MDI before, it may have been a TGP. Um, I know we've seen them before, though, so uh, they are also veterans, just, oh, I think, only this expansion so far. Yeah, I mean, it's always difficult when we have a lot of teams who are changing names every season. And yet, many of the people that we see on the roster, of course, are very well recognized in the community as they come together and give it a shot in an MDI or even sometimes in their first MDIs. Now, here with Eclipse versus Ducks Can Fly, we are going to have our uh, bands that we can actually see here. So we'll be starting out with Galacron's Fall. We'll have bands on the next two as well there. Um, but we're going to be getting into the game very quickly here. Galacron to start us off, which is a very exciting one. Nagura, what are you thinking so far about these two teams coming in for Galacron? All right, so we do see uh, already from the get-go a big difference in composition here as Eclipse is running the 4 DPS comp with the Red Paladin. So this is kind of the Echo comp we've seen. Uh, Sally has been playing the Red Paladin very much last weekend. While Ducks Can Fly is running the healer. Luca uh, on the Raster Druid there as uh, they both pull all the trash into that first boss. We'll see if the extra DPS actually manages them to finish off the boss a little bit quicker. Yeah, that means Eclipse are going to be attempting a no healer with the bursting affix active, which mm. we talked about a little bit last series, or you guys talked about rather, uh, being a affix that really challenges you if you're trying to do it without a healer, which uh, we're going to see throughout this dungeon. Now, the nice thing about Fall is that there aren't really too many huge trash pulls where you're going to get a bunch of bursting stacks, right? That first pull we just had there was one of them, uh, and Mass Spell, of course, an option to help uh, help handle there. But then in this next area, there's going to be a few, you know, eight stacks of, of bursting that you have to deal with, possibly. Uh, but, you know, that's defensives. You've got Imp to spell if you need as well for that area. Uh, and then the rest of the dungeon is mostly very small trash pulls that don't give you a lot of stacks. So I think it I think it should work out, especially given that the key level is 22, which is uh, on our lower end of key levels. I think they'll be able to make it work, but it's a question of like, are they going to have to spend a bunch of time trying to live the burst thing that might just make the healer comp faster? Because it's not like the Rest of Druid is doing low damage for Ducks Can Fly, right? Rest of Druid does a ton of damage and also means that you just don't have to worry at all. You don't have to commit any DPS globals to living stuff like Bursting. They have often tried yeah, we do also see a lay on hands uh, used by the Red Paladin on Eclipse side to make sure the mage stays alive with Bursting and the Dot. A lot of tra a lot of damage coming in from this trash here specifically. Indeed. Even though it is not fortified, still it can be a bad combination of dots and other abilities, plus bursting as well that we just talked about. Now one thing to mention as well is that Ducks Can Fly actually dealt with 5% additional enemy forces on that first boss, while Eclipse not having the healer, probably not being able to pull that extra trash. So Eclipse has to make up that percentage somewhere else, which may or may not um, cost them some time later on. We'll see how they handle that as both of them, both of the teams are dealing with this trash room pretty quickly, doing some pretty uh, big pulls on both sides. Sacrifice used as well to try and get them through on the side of Eclipse. It's going to work out. It's going to be close, but you can also see they all have um, that debuff. That debuff that's on the Warlock and the Paladin right now, that's that new health potion this patch, the one that heals you for your full health bar pretty much, but then leaves a dot behind on you. And it looks like they've decided to go with that one rather than the one that heals you over time instead the one that you know uh is a little bit i guess 
I think that one's more intuitively appealing to people, but the size of the healing on that toxic one, as long as you make sure you actually press it, uh, you're going to be 100% HP, which makes it really, really good. Yeah, and I think especially with um, not running a healer, it does make a lot of sense. Uh, if you know how to use it, and if you have other defensives that maybe work around um, that dot afterwards, that is uh, something that you can for sure pull off, and I think it did save um, their life on that one. But now both teams are fighting manifested time ways, which again, without a healer can be a little bit difficult, but uh, the magic effect actually can be dispelled by two players on Eclipse's side, with the Shadow Priest and the Warlock possibly running that imp as well to be able to dispel that, so they don't have to worry about that uh, magic dispel too much without the healer, while of course in Ducks Can Fly they have the Rasta Druid who can dispel so they don't have to worry about running any kind of imp or Count placing their second. mass to spell the correct ways. Eclipse having that bursting come out as they finish some of the trash there looked a little bit sketchy. Ooh. And we actually see a dispel come out in the wrong zone. So we actually do another one. So both of them getting dispelled in the wrong side. Wait, 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 hang on. dangerous for Eclipse unless it's intended. Yeah, it could be, right? You just kill the boss before the circle touches you. I mean, you could also demonic circle it, but it looks like Krona's not going to do that. He's just going to die to it, and uh, that's going to be one death. Uh, yeah, okay, that wasn't intentional then. That would be a cool play to make, to just avoid yeah. it and just never take the damage until the end, but the boss HP was just a little bit too high for them to uh, attempt that, and I don't think they were attempting it. I think there was just a, a miscommunication about when the dispel was coming out or where the, uh, the player was supposed to be. All good, though. One thing that Chrono's doing here that's really good is not releasing. There's no combat here until your graveyard gets updated, so you just wait until you get through to the next area and then release, and much better uh, much better use of time than waiting for a res. Yeah, definitely. We do see, again, the enemy forces now 5% still in favor of Ducks Can Fly, so Eclipse does have to make that extra percentage up somewhere which they did not manage to do just yet in the previous area because you have to finish most of the trash there anyway to spawn the boss. Um, but we'll see what they do later on as they take another portal and uh, another set of dragons to the next area. Again, Krona is not disconnected or anything. He's just waiting for the graveyard to update and then he's going to join the group as well. And Bloodlust also... I'm pretty sure Bloodlust was used for Eclipse, right? This is just... Um, uh, and yeah. yeah, there we go. So the five minute cooldown for both teams to use the bloodlust on that first one. She must have been careful. Dude, one uh, extra benefit of the rep pally is Crusader Aura for this long yeah. mounted run. You get a couple extra seconds off of that if you are playing the rep pally here. But here comes the challenge for Eclipse. They've got to deal with these three dragons with no healer. Now it is only a 22 tyrannical, so that is, I guess, the easiest possible combination of affixes uh, that we have for this dungeon for this pull. Uh, and so that's why I think they're comfortable pulling all three rather than doing a gateway skip and only pulling two. Uh, but it is still pretty sketchy. There's that master spell instantly going to come out to take off those bursting stacks uh, because there's still the risen da dragon ticking damage. Meanwhile, Ducks Can Fly are only doing the two Risen Dragons, and one thing they've done that's really nice is they've hit Sigil of Misery on a bunch of those chunks over there, uh, which means they could just bring them in later. They can bring them in with the boss, they can use them for extra prior damage onto the boss, uh, or they can just have them come in, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll bring them into the boss, and that is uh, a nice little bit of extra damage on the boss, actually, that you get uh, from specs like the Destro Lock and the Shadow Priest. Yeah, one thing to note about um, the difference in composition is also Eclipse running full dwarfs, except on Kira, their tank with the Shadow Meld, right? Because, uh, of course, not having the healer, Master Spell is nice, but you don't always have it. So having a dwarf racial to save you from bursting once in a while, very nice. What it also means, though, is that you cannot Shadow Meld off the corruption on this boss here. So you're going to have to deal with it. Now, I do think... Um, or the Corrosion, rather. I do think um, they are able to deal with it just fine. We see one of them being in a mage right now, uh, using that uh, huge DR, that Ice Cold ability, uh, to be able to, to survive it. And they can just pass it on to Kira onto the tank. And so they should be okay, technically, on that 22 Tyrannical. But still, something to watch out for. While Ducks can fly, on the other hand, uh, they do have one additional Shadow Melt on their rest. Yeah, they've still chosen to play Dwarf on all of the characters that are allowed to, right? It's just Druids and Demon Hunters aren't allowed to play Dwarf. It's uh, it's still locked away, so uh, making the best of it with the Shadow Meld if they, if they do happen to have their healer get targeted. Um, not something you worry too much about in a 22 key, right, is yeah. the damage of that ability. It, it's not, it's not going to one-shot or anything like that, but it is still nice, and it's not only nice for survivability, 
anytime you don't have to spend a global healing, that's an extra global you get to spend doing damage, right? So uh, it is actually a damage increase. You can see that Shadow Meld comes out there yeah. from Luca, and uh, yeah, nice, nice little bit of extra value. Yeah, and we also see the percentage now updated because uh, um, ducks can fly. Managed to skip that one dragon. Eclipse played it, and now Eclipse is basically even with the percentage with any before. This is a ducks can fly. The extra little bit of percent is not uh, something that is going to be very relevant. But Eclipse now finishing off the boss, and they're going to be moving on towards that last boss area with the trash that they're very likely going to pull on top of the boss. Um, we'll see how they handle that exactly, because it takes a little bit of time for the last boss to actually spawn. There's a little bit of uh, RP going on, so we'll see what their strategy is. We've seen teams approach this differently. Some teams even waited at the start for the, like somebody with invisibility to walk through and uh, uh, trigger the event, and then everyone else followed. But it looks like Eclipse not waiting around at all, as they're just running through, pulling everything to the last boss. And before we engage the last boss, I do want to quickly also mention the time that we had in this dungeon last weekend. Because last weekend we had very similar affixes. We had a 22 tyrannical incorporal spiteful. And the best run we had was in 11 minutes and 10 seconds clear by dogs. Yeah, of course the, of course the different affixes, but still something that we can get a little bit of an idea with the comparison here. And I guess one thing that we're learning is that this is only barely a two lust dungeon <laughs> at this speed, right? Yeah. Eclipse's uh, lust is only coming up in 44 seconds. They're already pulling the boss here, so it's going to come up during the burn of the, uh, of the boss, which is kind of crazy. The other thing to note for Eclipse here is that they are in a little bit of danger of if things get bad here, if they start losing players, they're gonna wipe because they don't have a good way to heal Morchi or Chromie rather. If uh, if she gets low, right? If she, which she does, right? You don't have, you have to heal her up before the second Stonecracker barrage, and uh, they don't have a good way of doing that. I mean, I guess you could try an off heal if you knew that you were gonna get that intermission, but for the most part, they tend to just play with we're making it to that, we're making the push in time, or or not at all. Yeah, and their lay enhanced and cooldown as well because lay enhanced had to be used earlier in the though. trash. It's coming up in, in 14 seconds, so they, should, they are going to be able to use that. Yeah, Bloodlust now got ready. They are immediately pressing it. Um, we'll see if they manage to uh, push that boss into the face before Chromie does go down. Ducks can fly on the other hand. Not having that issue because they, of course, have that healer, so they don't have to use any kind of off healing onto Chromie. So they might be able, there might be a chance that Ducks can fly can catch up. But it's going to be very difficult because Eclipse is just melting that boss. Yeah, one other nice ability you can meld, by the way, here is the attack from the boss, the uh, the big circle. But we are going to see a death to bursting, actually, from Ducks Can Fly. Uh, going to take the res, hopefully, soon. But that's going to mean it's really tough for them to get through the shield. And as long as Eclipse can hold on here, they are entering that final cataclysmic obliteration cast here. A zero, actually a one death run for them. And the end timer is coming soon here because the boss does die at 85%. So Eclipse are going to come out to a lead here. It's going to be 11 minutes, 24 seconds. 20... Actually, we got to wait. <laughs> we got to wait for this RP bit to finish, don't we? So <laughs> there it is. 11.28. Eclipse are going to take the win. 11.28. Eclipse coming in showing that even though the name is new and the first time they're debuting it here, they are anything but experienced. They are experienced players. They know the scene. And a lot of you may even recognize them as being in last season's TGP, where three of their players were in last minute. So this first victory is going to go to Eclipse, and they are setting this bar high right off the bat. But, of course, we saw a lot of strategies in this dungeon. Everything from the dispels to the comp decisions to the racial choices um, that I'd love to hear broken down a little bit more, Zyronic. Yeah. And it starts off right here on the first boss, using some tech that we found out from last week where you can mind control one of the Chrono Weavers here to use the Chrono Melt on the boss here to reduce its haste and also make it so that its spell queuing gets a little out of sync so you get less of those sand pools. You notice the boss is at 50% here and there's not a single sand pool in the room. It's a really interesting tech that, that uh, no heal teams have come up with just to kind of reduce the overall AoE damage in the fight. Now looking at the affix combination we have this week compared to last week, we added bursting this week instead of what we had last week, which is just an extra toll on the team here. And honestly for me made me think that they probably wouldn't run a no healer setup, but this is the area of the dungeon I was probably most concerned for the bursting setup. But now that you think about it, like, as long as you're using your master spells efficiently, using your dwarves efficiently, you're really only ever getting up to five or six stacks of bursting in this section of the dungeon. Maybe ten if you're a tank, but you don't really care about that too much. 
as a tank anyways, because you can just heal yourself. So it didn't really seem like it was that big of a deal. And also one final little bit of text just to make it so that AG doesn't have to do as much off healing here at the end here. They end up just insta-dispelling both of their last two debuffs in the slow puddle instead of the AoE puddle, so you don't take that extra burst of AoE damage when it gets dispelled. And they would have gotten away with this with no deaths. Unfortunately, at the last second, Chrono oh. made the decision to run through instead of taking the portal. But, you know, that's not really, like, a bad decision there. He maybe could have lived that. If he took his portal, he was going to get mowed, by, mowed down by a set of orbs anyway, so he was kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place there. Ended up dying. Didn't cost them too much because he could just wait for them to run past the RP, so it wasn't that big of a deal. And at the end here, the final boss here... When you know you're only going to take one Stonecracker Barrage, you can just stack every single personal cooldown on the first one, even committing health potions there just to make sure they don't take any extra deaths there. And it was a really clean run from them. Only 15 seconds slower than our fastest run last weekend with the addition of the Bursting Affix is a pretty impressive run from them. And like you were mentioning, Rook, this is a team that does have experience, right? They were in TGP. They're known high-key pushers, so they do have that acumen of being, like, really solid players. And... They're a good team. They could definitely go far and be one of our top four that qualifies for the global finals. I would love to see that for them. I mean, as we've talked about, you always want to see the competition be fiercer, and especially with us consolidating down to the top 16 teams versus previous M uh, MDIs. 24 that we had i mean we've really seen the concentration of skill here as all of these different groups show why they deserve to be here in these top groups um of course though ducks can fly wonderful folks as well with experience at mdi and a great sense of playing together which you really love to see it they've they've played together for years they are really comfortable with each other as a group and so you know i think there's something to be said about that as well of course experience is one thing but also just vibing well with people you're playing with with is a huge part of it too. Now I know we have coming up next uh, some some additional dungeons, some extra challenges here. I think Black Rook is up for them, which means if we take a look up there, it is, which means that we're going to have some extra challenges. We saw some deaths on this even earlier with the current affixes. Nagura, what do you think these two teams are going to be keeping in mind as they come into this next dungeon? It's going to be interesting to see what the uh, what those two teams are going to be showing us because the last. Teams we saw in this dungeon, of course, Perplexed and um, uh, Bone Butts, they did disagree on the composition. We saw Perplexed play with a healer, while Bone Butts played without, and they played with an AUG Evoker instead. Now, um, we did see Eclipse run the no healer and fall, but they played the Red Paladin. But we have the Raging Affix in uh, Blackrock, so are they going to switch? If they run the 4 he the four DPS comp, are they going to play the AUG Evoker as well to have that uh, oppressive roar to get rid of the Raging? Or are they going to go back and play with a healer? And what is Ducks can Fly going to do? They already played the healer in fall. Are you going to stick to it? Uh, I think it's very interesting to see that the teams don't necessarily all agree if the 4 DPS is actually worth it or not. And some dungeons, everyone's doing it. But in most dungeons, we have this disagreement, which is something I really like to see. Um, the fact that it's just not a clear-cut decision on the composition here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely something that... Of course, we always like in MMOs to think more damage, more better. That's going to make everything go faster. If something dies faster, then you don't have to heal as much. But as we see, it's not always the case. But it has become a big conversation point, especially as we've seen some of these hybrid classes kind of hit the scene or have some of those capabilities expanded upon. So, I mean, Zyronic, as we think about this sort of decision between the DPS, do we bring the healer? What do you think this time around in the MDI is really sort of the determining factor for teams and whether or not they decide to do this? Well, it's just a matter of whether it's possible or not, right? And that's going to be a lot of the practice going into the global finals, I would assume, is finding out whether or not the 4 DPS is even possible. Because if, if it is possible, somebody's going to do it. And if they're doing it and you're not, chances are they're going to be faster than you. And I know you were kind of aiming a little bit with the more DPS, more better, but that literally <laughs> generally is how the MDI goes. And it's actually kind of insane to to see how much off healing is possible, especially just from like passive cooldowns that you can use, like Vampiric Embrace and Nature's Vigil that just, you know, heal your team when you do damage. Those have gotten nerfed this expansion already. They got nerfed a ton after Season 1 when people were playing, you know, Shaman Priest, Moonkin, stuff like that. And now they're just back in strength. We've we've seen like bursts of 200k healing over the course of an entire Vampiric Embrace and in dungeons like the fall that we just saw. Those those off spec cooldowns are so incredibly strong when you put when you partner that with you know Red Paladin that can throw out flashes and just top people off. I mean, 
it can be used in a lot of dungeons, especially if the if the dungeon levels are in this 22-23 range. So I assume we'll see a lot of this this weekend as teams kind of saw how strong it was last mm. weekend. I mean, listen, as a healer main, yeah, I memed a little bit because I love healing. So please continue to give me a job. I love it. But it is really impressive to see how these teams are taking these considerations into account. And we'll have to see here which ones they decide to bring in, what the compositions are, and what Eclipse and Ducks Can Fly will do here in this second map. Nagura, would you like to take it away? Yes, it looks like Eclipse and Ducks Can Fly do completely disagree with Bone Butts and not playing the healer here, as both of the teams are bringing in the Raster Druids and otherwise are play playing that full ranged cloth comp. Uh, both teams also immediately walking towards that first boss, uh, engaging uh, Amalgam here, and also bringing in a lot of trash. Both of them eclipsed one second quicker on the boss pool, so they were uh, they had a little bit of a faster travel time. And we also see if there's any kind of difference in how to deal with the trash. First, they have to wait for all of the trash to walk in, though, but are they going to be seeing it, finish up the boss first, and then deal with the trash? Or are they just kind of like dealing with it simultaneously? That is also a difference we've seen in the previous uh, series between Perplexed and Bone Butts as well. Looks like both teams are going to just take the trash right into the middle of the boss here, which this is the fastest way to do this, right? What you're mostly going to be waiting on is the RP. When the boss dies, you're waiting for the door to open. But you also do need to make sure that Lady Valandris Ravencrest dies before that, that door opens as well, or not long after, because that's, you know, the other thing that you would be waiting on, as we do have an Afflicted spawn coming out. And actually Eclipse, ooh, in some danger, but it's Ducks Can Fly that are going to have our first death here, followed quickly by our second death, to Soul Blast and Soul Blade, respectively. Those are really nasty abilities here. Oh no, and nearly a Sight Death as well. Looks like everybody's going to be okay, except for their healer as well. So Ducks Can Fly, really having some deaths here. The good news for them is they can just hit Release, and so they're only losing those five seconds, plus people's cooldowns, plus Cauterize. So <laughs> look, it's not great. Plus everything. It's not great. <laughs> but it's not the end of the world, right? Like, it's three deaths, and they're not wiping. That's good. That is true. They did finish off the boss, which is the most important thing. Otherwise, they would have lost an insane amount of time. But they're not out just yet, of course, as Eclipse is about to finish off that mini boss. But they still have to wait for the door to open. So even though they did finish off the mini boss quicker, yeah, just still had to wait and walk against the door a little bit. Ducks can fly about to finish off their mini boss as well, but of course, a little bit behind at this point because of those extra deaths. And we'll see how big Eclipse is pulling too in this next trash area. The next trash area can be incredibly dangerous, especially with the Raging Affix, as you have um, the Arcanist that has to be interrupted on the Arcane Blasts, you have the Archers with the Shoot, uh, you have the Scouts with the Fan of Knives, you have the Companion that is jumping around, putting Bleed on everybody, can be super dangerous. We'll see how big they're going as well with the pulls here. It looks like they pulled two packs together without that Companion Patrol. Yeah, a little bit of options here for the teams. I mean... It's it's tough to it's tough to fight all this at once, right? Every single mob that you could fight because there's so many scouts and archers. And the other problem in this area is the archers just jump away and start shooting at you. Not only is that lethal, but it also really extends how long the pull lasts. So Eclipse making the decision to split that into two pulls. Same with ducks can fly. I think this makes a lot of sense, right? You you always have this urge to just pull everything, right? And that's I'm sure that teams have tried that, just going all the way, you know, into the room and fighting everything at once, maybe line of sighting behind a pillar, but there's just too many scouts and archers, I think, especially with raging, right? Raging is gonna mean that they're those scouts are gonna be doing that knife dance, those archers are gonna be doing their shoots and barrages, and you won't be able to interfere with it below thirty percent health. Nobody's playing an evoker, so nobody has that oppressing roar. Uh, to hit them with that, that AoE Soothe, so you just gotta kill them, and if you're fighting too many at once, that is just gonna be lethal. Yeah, Marriage just go down, unfortunately, for Ducks Can Fly, as they are using a Battle Rest to get their Shadow Priest back up, because they're in the middle of a pool here, it does take a uh, some time to walk back. Another death on their Mage, their Arcane Blitz not being oh, interrupted, no. as Luca does go down too, to a Knife Dance from one of those scouts that is enraging, was, we're not able to interrupt that or uh, disrupt that rather. So losing some players for Ducks Can Fly, not going too, too well as they have to finish off that champion. Thankfully the champion, not too big of a problem. The only thing it does is that frontal, but the next pack already spawned with that mini boss. So they have to make sure they're recovering here and they need to get Luca back to the group on that rest to do it to heal everyone up before they die to any kind of residual damage. Otherwise they have to walk some oh. minor signs as their lock unfortunately gets to go down to knife dance, just barely being in range of that ability. 
I think they did try to outrange it there for a second. Yeah, it was a good effort, but unfortunately Ducks Can Fly gonna have another one of these sort of half wipes. This one was a bit more costly than the one before, because this time the graveyard is much further away, right? It's still back at that first boss, so they lost a bit more time uh, to this particular one. That means that they're now probably something like a minute and a half behind Eclipse, which... It's not insurmountable, but at this point they are probably, if you're a Ducks Can Fly fan, you're probably looking for Eclipse to have some kind of mistake, right? To not even like a, a small thing, you're looking for Eclipse to probably have a wipe of some kind. Uh, and that, the good news, the good news if you're a Ducks Can Fly fan is that there are still two really hard pulls ahead of Eclipse, right? There's the, uh, the big hallway, and then there's the Smash Bite pull, both of which have caused a lot of teams problems in our previous weeks. I would say the Smash Fight pull, it, we're, we're going to see that in a bit, but it's not its not hard if you set it up right, but it is difficult to set it up correctly and only get the two Dominators, right? That's something, if you're trying to do it quickly, uh, that might go wrong. So, yeah, almost a full boss health bar now separating the two teams. That is quite a bit. Yeah, very unfortunate for Dusk and Fly, as Luke actually in a little bit of trouble there, the rest of it on uh, the right side team, as he has to use uh, Leon Hand's Potion. Luke actually going down, no Battle Rest available, or ducks can fly, that means they have to finish this boss without the healer, which is possible. Uh, of course, we see Eclipse, um, or we saw Bone Buds earlier do this boss complete without a healer, but Merge going down too. Oh, just everything a little bit I would just wipe. Yeah, here. This is good. As, yeah, they are wiping, trying again. Yeah, it's unfortunate with, with that trash, with the archers just being a little bit out of control, not being able to finish oh. them off or group them up properly. And yeah, these shoots doing so much damage on a 23 45. This is not good. Look at the, look at the run back as well that they're gonna have to do here. This is just this is brutal for Ducks Can Fly. So um, now they are probably on the order of four minutes, maybe four and a half behind. Eclipse are starting to open up the sort of lead where they might be able to win even if they wipe. But of course. They would like to just have their own clean run, right? They would like to maintain a zero death run, uh, really put a, uh, their mark on this series, enter tomorrow with some confidence, uh, and that is still uh, still important. And they could, of course, still wipe to the remainder of the dungeon, but we are really looking at two pulls left in the dungeon, right? There's the next boss with all the trash, and then there's the last boss with all the trash. So really not much time left uh, for something to go wrong here. Yep, Eclipse now gathering up, uh, or walking up the stairs, not gathering the boulders, they're trying to avoid the boulders. And uh, we'll see if they skip any of these foul dominators as well. Looks like Krona is about to set up uh, a gateway, there we go. Uh, so we don't have to use any kind of invis potions to get past these dominators, because uh, they want to pull the, at least two of the dominators into Smash Spite, and they want to make sure they don't have more than those two, otherwise they are going to run out of um, interrupts for them. It looks like the gateway maybe didn't quite work, or maybe hmm. maybe you need to double jump to use it. So only Kiera was able to use it possibly, uh, while Krona's model was not high enough to, to use that gateway. Sometimes that is an issue for sure, um, as Krona and Yargi did use it in this potion, while everyone else uh, did manage to use that gateway. And the Dominators are coming in. So we have the two Dominators, um, which is probably fine, I believe, with uh, the interrupts that they have available to get to not have that Fell Frenzy go through. Yeah, that, that is exactly it. The cast is actually pretty quick, so you do need to have, like, you can't just have a a single ranged kick handle it, so if you added a third Dominator, they would be in some trouble, and that caused multiple teams uh, to wipe to this boss last weekend. This time around, though, Eclipse just have those two Dominators, so once they deal with this boss, they're just going to have 12 mobs and the last boss ahead of them. Not a whole lot of dungeon as ducks can fly. Are still working on Ilisana Ravencrest. Nearly done there, but uh, this is getting quite rough there. You can see on the boss two split, right? Boss one split, almost identical between the two teams. The boss two split, it's going to be three minutes advantage for Eclipse. That is massive. Yeah, Eclipse is actually looking very strong with the zero deaths on the board as well, having a super clean run. Uh, now we did have the uh, BRH played earlier as well. And the fastest run we have so far, which is faster than any run we saw last weekend, is 11 minutes and 16 seconds by Perplex. So we'll see if Eclipse uh, can get close to that time or even beat that time on their side as they're now gathering up the Swordsman and the Lancers, um, probably pulling it onto the last boss, unless they're deciding to play a little bit safer. If 
they're aware of the wipe from Ducks Can Fly. That is something that the teams, of course, uh, with a little bit of a delay, they'll be able to notice if something went wrong for the other team, if they're paying attention to it. Some teams have said they're not paying attention to the other team at all, and they're just sticking to their strategies. And other teams have been saying that they are listening to broadcast, and if there's something like a major wipe on the other team, then they are actually changing their strategy accordingly and doing maybe something less risky. But Eclipse not doing anything less risky, as uh, they are pulling all of these swordsmen and the lancers onto the boss. Yeah, you know, there are some spots in some dungeons where teams know teams have two different options for how they want to pull, but this pull in particular, uh, I think Eclipse are feeling pretty comfortable about. Like, it looks pretty scary, but you have a lot of control for these mobs. You get to kind of fight them while nothing is happening during this RP, uh, and it feels really inefficient to not have something to do during this RP. And unlike last week's Black Rick Hold, there is no Sanguine active. So. Yeah, but Raging, like, I feel like the damage on the tank here can be pretty dangerous, no, at the start of this phase. You don't have to yeah, yet, all of these mobs are raging. No. And a swarm can stun you at the lands you can jump on you because you have the raging so you can't interrupt it. But it is looking pretty good for Eclipse as they do have the buff on all of the players now. So they're able to finish up all of the trash. And they also have Bloodlust running too at this point as it came back up. We are soon to be 11 minutes into the dungeon. So uh, unless they can finish off the boss in 15 seconds from here, uh, I think they're going to be slightly slower than perplexed. But uh, still an incredible clean run by Eclipse. Yeah, this is looking really, really, really good for Eclipse and uh, their hopes of making it into the top four, making it out of this weekend are looking really solid. And honestly, with runs like this, I mean, this could be competitive for against Mandatory and Perplexed as well, potentially here. This is a really, really solid showing they've had in this series. Uh, just incredible work. It's going to be another another sub-12 minute run here. There it is, 11.37, Eclipse, no deaths, take the series 2-0. Well done to Eclipse. They are going to claim this smoothly, easily, and with all the confidence that those veteran members of the team have brought to it. Maybe before this, we didn't know Eclipse, even if we knew some of their members, but now we definitely have the name Eclipse on our minds. You know, Ducks, they did the best they could. They flew with those little wings and they're gonna be going down to the lower bracket where they'll have another chance at getting into the top four to, uh, for this weekend, which will move ahead to our grand finals. Now, as we review some of these matches and we take a look back at this Black Rook, I mean, a lot of things went wrong for Ducks, but what are we kind of thinking as we come out of this one, Zeronic? Yeah. Uh Listen, this was this was our closest match in terms of like team seeds, right? This was Ducks can fly at our tenth seed coming into the weekend versus uh, versus our seventh seed, right? So it should have technically been the closest match, but unfortunately, just this just kind of got away from Ducks can fly. Too many small personal mistakes, too many random spot deaths that kind of tumbled out of their control like dominoes falling in a row, right? You know, in certain areas, uh, your healer dying on trash really kind of sets you behind and although the range players did their best job of trying to outrange as much of the damage as possible they just couldn't get it done right it was too many areas too many deaths in that second boss area on the other hand eclipse honestly i don't have a lot to cover for them which is both not necessarily a bad thing it's more of a good thing right this was a textbook run from them they took the strategy that we saw last week and executed it to perfection zero death run fast time no real major outliers in terms of mistakes made, and if they can keep this up, they're pretty much going to guaranteed punch their ticket to a top four, which is kind of the major thing you want to do this weekend, right? Yes, there is a little bit of extra prize pool bump if you do get, you know, into the higher positions, but really the main prize is qualifying for global finals and having a chance at that, you know, two hundred thousand dollar prize pool, which looks like they're you know, if they keep playing like this, they're they're well on their way towards. They are. They are absolutely showing that they have the experience and the know-how to really pull off these consistent runs. I mean, so impressive. Like you were saying, that zero death run on a Black Rick. As far as I can recall, I think that's the only one that we've seen between the two weekends. Although, of course, we had some different affixes last weekend that also kind of threw a wrench into all of this. I'm curious, Dratnos, how much of a difference do you think these affixes between week one and week two are making? Yeah, I mean, I would say this is a lot better, a lot easier to do in Black or Cold than the Sanguine week was. Like, Sanguine is just such a, a technically intensive affix. There's so much uh, that you have to think about going into your pull with that, and still you're going to Sanguine heal a lot of mobs. We saw 80 million Sanguine healing on that corridor pull after Ilisana, uh last weekend. Um, 
Raging is definitely a threat, right? Raging can increase the chance that somebody is going to get killed by something that you would otherwise stun or uh, interrupt, but it's not going to cause the mobs to live longer unless it means the mobs kill somebody and then they're not damaging them, which uh, I think you'd choose these affixes every time if you were going for speed uh, over the over the Sanguine Week we had last time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the affixes make a huge difference, as we know, and Sanguine in particular not being here this week, I think, was probably a huge breath of relief for Group B. It really does make everything that much more difficult, and you have to be so strategic about that healing in all of your considerations for your runs, right? So, I mean, we have some challenges for sure with Group B, uh, but of course, on some of those major dungeons, not having that Sanguine <laughs> beyond them has been a huge, huge breath of relief, and of course, the ones that it is we're seeing banned pretty consistently uh, but i'm curious you know Negra, we've gotten a handful uh of our dungeons out of the way here already today how are you feeling about group b how do you think overall the mdi is kind of shaping up and is anything different this time around from previous ones um so i'm gonna actually <laughs> take this question and ignore it but absolutely. Cyronic is going to answer it. <laughs> Go for it. Oh, please. I'm absolutely. Sorry, no, no, no. Shake it up. I need to mention something. I need Go to mention it. something. So ducks can fly. There's this is the second time they've been competing. Or they have been competing before. I don't even know if it's the second time. Uh, but the first time they did compete, I was uh, looking at the roster on my stream. And I was like, oh, their healer is called Luca. And he's playing a shaman. Wow, that's so interesting. Because I have a shaman in my guild that's called Luca. And there was a whole meme because apparently it was that exact shaman that is playing in my guild. <laughs> so my whole guild was like, oh my god, Nagura doesn't know that Luca is competing in the MDI. <laughs> yeah. And today, of course, Luca competing again, my guild mate. <laughs> this whole time I wanted to like not mention that Luca is in my guild. Because, so it's a whole meme, right? And I just want to be like, oh, who's Luca? Who's Dax can fly? I don't know this group. Um, but I figured, you know what? I'm going to mention it anyway. But after their performance, I feel like I should have just not said anything. So, yeah, I don't know. Dax can fly. Maybe you should shape <laughs> up. <laughs> That's oh my brutal. goodness. <laughs> I'm only your friend if you do good at MDI. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> minute, minute and a half long rant just to flame her guildmate? Jesus. Caro. Yeah. You, so toxic. You need to play better in the lower bracket, oh yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, honestly, I'll just say, Ducks, I think you did great, Luca. If you're looking for new guildmates, new friends, let me let me offer forward myself. I mean, honestly, any time that teams step foot in this kind of competition, this level of competition, it is so impressive to me to see what they pull off. And everybody should be proud. Don't let Negra flame you too much, Luca. <laughs> You did great. <laughs> Way better. No. <laughs> Thinking about the greater questions again with the uh, MDI, unless, ironic, you have a guildmate you'd like to flame. Uh, you know, oh, I was curious. Sure. Oh, yeah, go for it, please. Absolutely. No, not right no, now. No, no. <laughs> we'll, we'll wait till, till later time for that. But no, I wanted to go back to the Aphex conversation because it's definitely something that's interesting to talk about and compare between the two weekends, right? Looking specifically at the Black Rick Hold we just had, right? When you talk about a Sanguine dungeon versus other affixes that also are pretty important to deal with, it really changes how you play the dungeon. We saw so much focus on mob control last week and making sure you do every little tiny thing perfectly right to minimize the amount of potential sanguine healing in the dungeon versus this week with Afflicted and Raging. Raging being something that could instantly one-shot you if you're not properly soothing the right mobs, which is really only going to be the job of the Resto Druid in the group, right? And then Afflicted as well adds an extra entire layer to the dungeon where every single time that Afflicted timer goes off, if you don't manage to get that dispel off properly, it could be a huge contributor towards a wipe and in some of these bigger pulls it really kind of adds to the cognitive overload of the pull right if one thing goes wrong it could very easily cascade into a wipe for the teams and that's something that we'll probably see when we get into the more competitive matches where people aren't wiping and it's just going to be kind of that one little thing that makes a difference between the top end teams but you know in general as a whole i think the affix uh, the affix system really kind of shows its strength in the mdi where it can kind of just completely change the way you play a dungeon Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the great strengths of Mythic Plus, right? And it's why it is such an incredible part of World of Warcraft. I mean, you hear so many other communities talking about it, how they love this system, how it adds so much to the dungeon experience. And even if, you know, sometimes you're suffering that pug life, you're trying to just get through, push those keys as high as you can. It's still something that brings such an incredible element, especially with the customization, the affixes, and the just scaling difficulty of these dungeons, which is phenomenal, honestly. Now, 
before we jump into our next map guesser segment, I wanted to give Dratnos a second here as well. You know, we've talked a little bit about this MDI versus other ones. Um, and of course, this time we had top 16 teams as opposed to top 24. Have you felt like this has changed the dynamic of the competition thus far? It certainly felt like it's already Saturday, even though it's Friday here, because we've just had, like, I mean, you look at those Ducks Can Fly runs, sure, there were a wipe and a half in that Black Rock Hold, but the fall was clean, and the Black Rock Hold was good as well. Like, the, the wipes were uh, people getting, you know, sniped by raging mobs or uh, the old Soul Blade or Soul Blast here or there, but it's not like their their run was fundamentally slower than Eclipse's. It's just things went a little bit wrong. Uh, maybe the Galakrond's fall, they did have the, the slightly slower strategy, but we're talking about a competitive series here on the Friday, which is one of my favorite parts uh, of the new format that we have here, along with, of course, the uh, more teams making it out of each group is pretty cool too, because there are a lot of deserving teams on your screen right now. It would be a shame if we had to cut down to only, say, two of them, uh, but instead we've got four. Four of these teams will make it through to the, the global finals, and there are a lot of powerful players spread across these eight teams. It's going to be very tightly contested, even though there are four whole slots. There really are. I mean, there have been some jokes about just the European power we have in Group B, of course. But between both Group A and Group B, there are some legendary teams in here, and literally teams called legendary, but really incredible players. And of course, one of the great things about consolidating down the amount of teams, as well as, like you were just saying, Dratnos, getting those extra teams in for from each weekend to make it to the grand finals, it really makes sure that the competition is neck and neck. It consolidates it all and gives us so much more to look forward to. Um, and of course, if you're just joining us this weekend, as a little reminder, our day one are our initial upper bracket series. Day two, teams will officially get eliminated. And day three, our top four for group B will be determined, a champion crowned. And then of course, next weekend, we will have our global finals where our eight finalist teams will be facing off. That's March 8th through 10th. As well as, just a little reminder to everybody, if you haven't yet and you're interested, give it a shot. Register on Raider.io. GP will be commencing in season four. So if you'd like to be a part or just get in there, give it a good shot. Don't worry too much. Uh, you know, have a good time. Put yourself out there. And even like our ducks that we saw here, if your guildmates <laughs> tease you about it, you still have a lot to be proud of. So uh, definitely jump in for it. Now, we actually have a fun segment ourselves here that we're going to be jumping into, which is the Warcraft Logs map movement segment. These are dungeon movement maps where we and all of you in chat are going to have to try to guess the dungeon boss based on the movement of the players. These are all actual footage this is replay movements of the MDI thus far. Um, and we're going to try to guess which boss it is out of four here. So we'll take a look at the pathway that's going to be tread. It's always so impressive to me how quickly so many folks can identify a bunch of dots and lines on the screen. It, it's amazing. But when it clicks, it clicks. So, uh, Nagura, what do you see here? What are we thinking? Hmm. Good question. We're going to get a meeting of the minds here. we got to all talk about this. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me all, we'll all just sort I'm ready to, I'm ready to insta, insta call this one a bull call. <laughs> it's bull call a thousand percent. I The mage was over on the side there hitting that one totem. Right, they were, uh, well, I guess that wouldn't explain necessarily the Demon Hunter's movement, though. I, I haven't seen call. a full, I haven't seen all five get knocked back yet, so it's probably not Smash Bite. Yeah. Uh, it's not Algemat either. No, this could be an Osana. Osana. This could be an Osana. Osana. Yeah. yeah, it, it, it so could be. It's moving so much for It's a lot. I don't know, yeah. I, I mean, I, it could still be Volcal, right? And now they're just going around the edge of the room, <laughs> right? It does look kind of like a triangle. I'm, I'm down for Volcal. Yeah. Oh, okay, it's sort of taking a triangle shape. We got sort of a Dorito thing happening here. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Volcal now, I think. You might be thinking like, oh, why didn't they... But they, they're so far, so much range that they were allowed to play a lot in the mid at the start, except for the yeah. mage who didn't have to move because uh, they were just able to hit their totem. So yeah, I, I'm sticking with Volcal. Yes! Oh, yeah. you would be right! Two for two, baby, let's go. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Always trust your first instinct. <laughs> I love how some of these are like so clean, like you just see like a, a beautiful circle on the screen. And this one was just like zigzags all over, kind of makes a triangle by the end. I mean, definitely uh, a lot of movement from this run, but great job, everybody, determining what it was. And uh, in case you missed it last time, this segment is powered by Warcraft Logs. 
make sure you level up your gameplay. Don't miss out. Go visit archon.gg slash wow. You can use all their tools there to ensure that you have the best builds, that your gear is optimized, figure out what the meta is, and even more. I mean, whether or not you are a prolific Mythic Plus player or you're just somebody that wants to improve in whatever way, Warcraft Logs can make that happen. So be sure to go check them out. And a huge thank you again to them for helping us with these segments. Now, we've got more matches up after this. Of course, we did just see... Eclipse and Ducks can fly face off. Ducks can fly going down to the lower bracket where they will later be facing off against Bone Buds Resurrected tomorrow. But as for today, next up, we are going to have Mandatory and Sloth. These are two teams that many of us, even in our estimations of the top four for this weekend, we listed. And they are definitely going to be real contenders for the grand finals. Be sure to stay tuned in because it's going to be an exciting match.
Welcome back to the Mythic Dungeon International. We've been having a great day here with our Group B, some fierce competition and even fiercer yet to come. Of course, Tettles is back on the desk. And Tettles, I have to ask you something that the chat really wants to know about. Um, how do you choose to style your hair every day? Like, do you just go with the flow? Is there, you know, how do you kind of do that? What's your, what's your method, if you will? So you, you wake up, <laughs> you're like, wow, today is a great day to play World of Warcraft. And you hit your hair with a hand comb, and then you're like, wow, that's good enough. I love it. I love it. I mean, honestly, it's looking great. It's looking great today. I wish that I could get mine to do that without like a million pounds of product in it. it looks fantastic. But I think of your course, hair also we... looks great. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Thank you so kind. <laughs> You're Dratnos and Zeronic, both of you, hair on point as well. Great job, everyone. But we're not here just to, you know, share hair tips and talk about transmog. We're also here, it turns out, to talk about Mythic Dungeons. So we have an incredible matchup coming up next. Of course, Mandatory and Sloth, two of the most anticipated teams from this weekend. And I'm curious, Dratnos, why is everyone so hyped about them? What do we think that they're going to be bringing to the table? So this is going to be a pretty exciting series because Sloth are a histor they, they are historically quite a strong team. They've shown up in MDIs and done very well in the past. They've contested even Echo uh, before. So you can see a lot of us have predicted Sloth to do quite well, right? It's on all of our prediction boards except for Tettles even, uh, includes Sloth and I guess Nagura as well. Um, but they qualified with a very, very low time trial seeding here. So they're going to play against Mandatory, who are one of our top seeds here because of that. And the question is, did they just have, you know, a low amount of time, a bad time trial? Are they still going to be that team we remember that's really powerful? Or are they much more, are, are, you know, are they, are they actually going to, you know, struggle in a, in a big way that they haven't in previous seasons here? And is Mandatory going to stomp all over them? That's going to be the question. Uh, this is a team that historically is about this. They, they end up getting somewhere between like the seventh, eighth slot, and then like all the way up until like fourth place in global finals. And so that's why this is such an anticipated matchup too, because these are two teams that consistently qualify for global finals. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, yeah. Go ahead, Sarah. On the other side, mandatory is like for the past year and a half or two years or so, the only team that has really gone blow to blow with Echo, right? Like they're the, mm -hmm. when we look at teams that could potentially dethrone them, they are the team, right? They're the team that we're looking at to do it because they are that good. Looks like we're ready to already get into it, starting off the series with a Murazon Rise, which is a dungeon we didn't really see that much week, last week rather, I'd say. And here we go, we're already off to the races here. Skylark instantly jumping in, almost a pre-lust coming out from them as well. Here we go, gonna get all three of these mini boss trash mobs stacked up. And we are off to the AoE Blast races. So this is a really, really difficult pull to kind of deal with um, because of Sanguine. So whenever you're dealing with this pull most of the time, you're going to be using that Maiden and that Orb of Contemplation to kind of kill off all of these mages. But if you accidentally end up killing uh, the mobs and those vanguards and those mages off underneath the Maiden, it, the Maiden is just going to start healing to full. Like you see on the left side of your screen here, the Maiden is just stuck casting Ooh. that Radiance and that Orb inside of Sanguine, and Stove goes down on the side of Mandatory, and this is how fast this pull can just go awry with, with a little bit of Sanguine healing. Just a little bit, and it's already going downhill for them. You can see Sloth are doing a good job of keeping that Sanguine completely under control on their side, but they're taking a lot of AoE damage here as well. Oh my god, the no. volley went off! It hit everybody. Fortunately, just the one death taking out their Shadow Priest. Looks like they're still keeping this pull alive here. Great job from both teams to keep the damage down to a minimum, but that death is really going to cost Sloth here as they spend a lot of time finishing off their final mini boss whereas mandatory are already off and pulling more trash this is this is an awesome first pull so look at look at sanguine healing so we can see uh, the healing done meter you can see that mandatory had about 10.5 million sanguine healing in that first pull a lot of that actually went into the maiden where sloth had z like practically zero sanguine healing but now sloth are continuing to lose a little bit more time with that volley going off that death they actually missed the cycle to be able to pull these vanguards without that rift mage and and that that death that ended up only costing them five seconds on the death timer has now probably come to cost them about 30 to 35 seconds, Syra. Yeah, this is going to be a little weird, right? Because the timing that you're really looking for on this fight is you want to be able to kill the trash mobs off during like the intermission phase so you can pull them away from the boss while the boss yeah. stands there. And that delay means they really didn't get that much of their initial damage on the trash here, which means they're probably going to have to spend a lot of time focusing this trash down before the intermission, which means their boss damage is going to be a little bit less efficient. 
So far, so good. The cleave looks pretty good from them. It's, it's mostly going to be coming from the Warlock, though, right? They're going to be the majority of the AoE. And then, like, you'll get a little bit of extra cleave out of the, out of the like Fire Mage. The the They're doing a good job, though. Yeah. They're doing a really good job of focusing it down. They are kind of cooking the boss a little bit, even more than uh, Mandatory. Mandatory, in their first intermission, have, have tier down to 57%. Sloth? Oh my god, are they healing okay. the boss? No! No, 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 no. get him out! Oh, get him out! Okay, okay, one tick. okay. I, don't, I, I think they missed. I think they, only three mil? No. Maybe that's, maybe that's one tick. Maybe that's one tick. It's one tick, but it's all good. Yeah, we're back. Still pretty good, though. 36% on the first intermission. That's, like you said, about 20% better than what we saw from Mandatory, although Mandatory already threw that intermission phase with how, with how, with how much earlier they pulled the boss. The boss is instantly going to be dead in that damage buff phase. Going to be on towards the next of the trash, next of the trash, but it's not really that big of a difference, right? Like it's probably only going to come come down to maybe like ten to fifteen seconds. Yeah. What do you think about the uh, nine percent count differential? I think that that's like the big one, right? Yeah, that's pretty significant. Sloth is pulling a lot of this trash into the boss after the fact as well, but this bot this trash is going to be here for quite a while afterwards, and this is not trash that you really want to be dragging up towards the dragon, right? You really need to finish it off here. So they, they ended up pulling that pretty late. It's going to cost them quite a bit of extra time. So yeah, it's probably going to be closer to like a 25 or a 30 second difference, and there's a little bit of sanguine healing at the end of the pull here too, which is just costing them that much more time. And like. The thing to mention as well is this is not a very efficient trash pack to pull outside of the boss for a couple of different reasons. Number one, yeah. obviously you want to be cleaving. Whenever you can, you want to be cleaving. But number two, they're sitting on cooldowns right now. While that trash was alive, they didn't have Infernal Rolling. Simkins really doesn't want to pop the combustion there because he wants to have it on pull for this. And yeah, just lost time on cooldowns as well is going to cost them a lot of time. They're engaging Dude. this trash at the same time Mandatory finished it. That one death to that volley, I feel like has cascaded sloth into just a pretty large time loss. I, I think that that death, while it only ended up costing them five seconds on the death timer, I feel like it's actually ended up costing them something in the order of like 45 seconds, which is insane. Yeah, it really cost them a lot here. Mandatory getting three of their players through the rift. Are we going to have anyone join, or are they just going to sit back, relax, and wait for Do the rift to be open for them at this point? Yeah, they're probably waiting. I have a question. If you had all mm -hmm. five players make it through, would you just say, like, to hell with the rift, and then just go? So, like, uh, by activating the Rift, you, you unlock the checkpoint. Um, but these teams normally play to, like, not die at all. Would you even unlock it? Uh, I don't even know. That's a tough question, honestly. I, I think you still do just for safety. But I think if you're a team that's really going for, like, the fastest oh. strategy, maybe you don't unlock it? I don't, that's a tough question. I don't, I don't know the right answer. Simkins is what is doing in the industry what we call is running it down mid, I think, as he continues to... <laughs> Hit these vanguards and these oh, watchers. No. It can happen. You know, you, if you miss the cycle that you're used to, you got to start freeforming it, and that's exactly. never fun. And yeah, he's he's calling in here. He's just going to wait for the portal to be open. That can happen. You know, it's it's happened to the best of us. Okay, left side of the screen here, mandatory. Uh, they have killed off the double dragon, the saboteur and the diversionist, and now they're into this rift mage area. And this is the area that I think that we saw the most interesting and diverse strategies last week, where people were porting the rift mages um, interdimensionally and mel juggling to port them to both the Morchi and the battlefield platform. I'm interested in seeing if mandatory has picked up on this strategy and if they maybe even have like an adaptation of the strat that's a bit different than what we saw from Echo last weekend. I can't even think of something that would be faster, but if there is a team that could figure that out, it would be these guys. Let's see what the strategy is. If you want actually a more in-depth look at what that strategy was in particular, you can check out a video Dratnos made out on the Warcraft YouTube channel. Very yeah. interesting. But uh, watch that after this, Keith. Let's see, let's see what Mandatory so has to do first. So we can kind of talk them through it. Basically how this, this sand area works too is whenever you walk onto the portals, you have to walk onto the portals that Morchi is going to activate to take you to both the battlefield and uh, the Morchi encounter. Those two Rift Mages that are standing in front of that portal are the prerequisites of uh, getting those portals spawned. And so the Rift Mages, whenever they die, they drop a portal that more often than not, whenever you accidentally contact it, it just like teleports you to a weird spot in this area. And it normally doesn't matter. However, uh, when, with some meld juggling and some snapping, you can actually port them across. And so now Mandatory has grabbed the third Rift Mage of this area. So those only those two Rift Mages that I pointed out earlier, the ones that uh, need to actually be pulled. Sloth is having a lot of deaths, by the way, to the Bloom and the Infinite Burn cast going off Syro. That can happen in this, in this area. There's a lot of residual group damage that happens, and if things kind of, you know, 
a lot of proportion here. You can have a lot of deaths. You can see Malik really doesn't Ooh. want to deal with this trash here at all and is kind of line of sighting it here. I wonder what the strategy is here for them. What, what's Ma the plan here? What is this Rift Mage doing over here? Mason got yeah, Mason strength. ended up dying there. But it, well, most of what Mandatory is doing right here is setting up for this for this next pull, right? You can see Ooh, the DPS sloth. players are all preparing to use their Shadow Melds to drop combat and take this portal here. Once that Rift Mage is low, and if we get a POV of Skylark and Mode, we'll more than likely see them trying to whittle down this last Rift Mage. Sloth also looking to do the same thing. No, they're not doing the no, same Malik, thing. They're just killing off Malik this Rift Mage. died. Sloth has had a mm. lot of deaths uh, in this area. And now they have... Oh, gosh. Their ports are scuffed. Now they have to kill they off some no deviations. Room. They don't have their they don't have their gate on, up right now. Gate's still on cooldown. They didn't clear any of the uh, sand either, which is another huge pain. What is she doing here? Okay, so Skylark is really Skylark far building. away. Yeah, to get that that Rift Mage ported, and he's porting it to Mode. Mode's going to end up killing this off with like the Extinction Event uh, Iridol weapon. Oh, he actually has both of the Rift Mages on him. That's, oh, that's not see, ideal. That's that's not. Oh god, Mode's gonna have to die, and then they're gonna let that Rift yeah, Mage yeah. reset, and and so then Skylark is going to uh, Skylark and Mode are both gonna get summoned. Skylark is ideally going to sigil a flame that that fourth Rift Mage that accidentally ported to Mode, and then they're uh, gonna like accept the summon. Yeah, so look, Skylark it, teleported it in right now. Yeah, okay. They've got it, the Rift Mage. It got a bit scuffed. I I don't know how efficient this is timer wise now, if you make a mistake like that. With how much scuff there is, like. They probably lost, I would say, 30 to 45 seconds there, just from a few different things, not having the DPS there to finish off the Rift Mage, plus the random deaths from not properly snapping the Rift Mage. But I think all of that gets erased and more when you consider the fact that they get the next section of the battlefield and they get to kill it with Morgi, right? That is such a catastrophic time save that I think it's it's really still much faster. Judd and I were kind of mapping it out last weekend. We thought it was only like a like a forty five second time save if done perfectly. Um, but is but that including all of the RP time spent traveling between? It it seemed like the teams that weren't porting it were only behind about forty five seconds to it done perfectly. Uh, obviously, this okay. is different affix set completely, right? And I think that this is something right. that like the higher it goes, um, the slightly less good it is. But it, and especially if you have sanguine healing. Um, then it becomes like you know a lot more questionable. Mandatory is, kinda... is sitting in that other room right now. They're they're spending a lot of time setting this up properly. The the, the trick is Skylark is going to sigil of flame these mobs, and then right after he presses sigil of flame, he yeah. takes the portal so that he's out of combat. And then the sigil of flame hits, and the Farseers are like, "Oh, who hit me? Let me snap to them." And that's how exactly. they get to Morgi. So they've got the trash from the battlefield on top of Morchi here, and they can freely cleave it down while also killing a boss, which is still just a massive time save. Sloth is going to be doing the next, the same thing in a little bit here, but mm. they're still significantly behind from all of the random spot deaths they had in that sand area. Sloth actually did something that was kind of interesting here. They took the, the Horde Destroyer, and they pulled Cronaxi, which is a mob that's like outside of this area. Typically, you're not able to go through this wall whenever you're in combat, but classes like Evoker and, and Vengeance Demon Hunter are able to actually like glide around the gate. And so they were able to pull Cronaxi through that that wall, that and pull it into the Horde Destroyer, just making it a little bit more efficient of a pull. Cool. And uh, Sloth is not teleporting the Far Series and Raiders through; they're just killing them straight up here. Yeah, they didn't they didn't do the the portal juggling. I think a big thing, Zyro, by the way, with the mm -hmm. with the portal juggling is that those Rift Mages aren't efficient count; they're only about five count apiece. So right. like, you can get a lot better count elsewhere for how long they take to kill and stuff like that and so i think that's why one of the, that's one of the things at least in my opinion that makes it not the fastest thing ever even though it is like a 45 second time save which is large yeah surprisingly enough as much as the strat has already been cooked i think there's more cooking to be done i think there are ways to do this faster <laughs> we just haven't seen them yet and that's probably something we won't see until you know a global finals so so we're gonna I mean, snap gromash to morchi <laughs> That, I don't think that would work. Wait, well, te okay. Technically, we don't know if Gromash has a boss arena, quote unquote. So, like, could he be snapped, or does he actually have a boss tag to where you'd be snapped to him if you pulled him? <laughs> That's a great question. That's not what I know the answer to personally. <laughs> I did get to this dungeon. I was actually testing this out with the portaling, trying to figure out how useful it was on live. The answer was not very. <laughs> The warlock is actually what makes it uh, OP. Without the without the summon, it's actually not even that good of a strat. 
Yeah, that makes sense. It's it's actually really hard to pull off without summon, right? Because you have somebody just across the dungeon sitting there waiting. Mm -hmm. They have to find a quick way up you know, to the group, and there's really no quick way to the group. But mandatory now with the battlefield and Morchi dead. You can see they killed off Grimash Hellscream there in uh, 44 seconds. Although they did use their lust to do it, but that makes sense. You know, it's a single target encounter. You really don't want to be spending that much time doing that in the MDI. We're going to be moving on to the last trash pack of the dungeon. Just three easy mobs. All you got to do is interrupt them, and they're okay. And then we're on to the last boss, and they're they're at a pretty good pace. I, I don't remember what our fastest time in this dungeon was last weekend. And, you know, although we do have different uh, affixes, we can still kind of draw a comparison. I can pull it eyes. Oh, we don't even have a record in the spreadsheet. For it. We had like uh, seven. It was low 17. 1710. 1710 is the timer. Okay. So. And our affixes were uh, Fort Volcanic Spiteful last week. And we have a lower key level this week. It was 24 last week. So we can draw a little bit of a comparison. I I'd expect on a similar caliber run, like low 16s might be possible, potentially. That's with, perf that's with Perfect Sanguine Management and Perfect Portal yeah. setups, I think. Yeah, perfect right? Which is... Sanguine Not is probably... Here. <laughs> sanguine, I think, is the hardest affix for MDI style keys right where it just adds the most variance into what you're doing into your strategy because you can just be you know plus or minus 30 seconds on a pull um you can even be right. plus or minus a minute depending on how bad the sanguine healing really is yeah you have to know pretty intricately what like the the gcds are that mobs like to cast right if a cast has a really long channel cast you really need to make sure that you're properly kiting mobs around for it so that it doesn't Sanguine on top of a mob that wants to channel like like it almost happened for mandatory in that first uh, trash area of this dungeon here. A little bit of sanguine healing on the infinite slayer here for mandatory, but not too bad execution. And they we can see they have a pretty significant lead now. Sloth really lost a lot of time in that middle section of the dungeon and also not doing the portal tech. Probably uh, lost them a decent bit of time too. I think I think Sloth's issues were definitely the deaths in that sand area. Uh, yeah. they, and then they ended up having to clear out the deviations after they gated because they didn't have gate on cooldown. I feel like that was minutes lost. Um, I, I think that if Sloth had a perfect run and Mandatory had the run that they had, I think that Sloth might have been able to win this. But with those mistakes that they were playing in the sand area, it just kind of let it cascade out of control. And now Mandatory is getting ready to pull Chrono Lord Deus here, the final boss of Rise. Oh, yeah. Just gotta walk it in here. Don't need to make any mistakes, just deal with the boss and they'll be totally fine. And I expect them to be able to do that. Now, there were there was there, there were a few mistakes from them, right? The the snapping was a little bit unclean. There are, you know, a couple random spot deaths, but outside of that, you know, Sanguine relatively clean run for a strategy that's definitely been cooked. Yeah, a little bit of extra sanguine healing. Although not that much, it was only like twenty million, right? It wasn't it wasn't a massive amount like we've seen, you know, happen last week where we had, you know, one pull with eighty million sanguine healing in that black recalled. But, you know, everything well. does tend to add up. And when, this, and, and when this is the team that we expect to be the highest chance, to have the highest chance of taking down Echo, seeing, you know, a lot of tiny mistakes in a dungeon isn't necessarily what we want to see from them. But, you know, it's also the you, first match of the weekend, so got to grow into highest, it a little bit. You say highest chance of taking out Echo. Man, they have to get through Perplex this weekend, too. And and then all the other teams. Like, that is true. Look really good. I, I think that this weekend is really stacked. Um... Mm -hmm. And I mean, even this first matchup between Sloth and Mandatory, I think that if things go slightly differently, the Sloth should be able to take down this map. Yeah, I, I also expect more from Sloth because of their pedigree that they've had in the past and the fact that they've been able to cook up strategies that are unseen of. I mean, the, the yeah. thing that comes to mind for me pers personally is their Theater of Pain strategy was groundbreaking back when they came up with it, right? It was like two minutes faster than anything we'd seen at the time, which is pretty crazy for a 16-minute dungeon. If, they, if, if that's the form that they're in this weekend, they can very easily upset a couple of teams and make their way into the top four pretty easily, and actually probably go even higher than that. But this first dungeon from them, not what I want to see from them. I mean, very unfortunate that the, the one spot of the dungeon they have the most mistakes ends up costing them a pretty ridiculous amount of time. Mandatory finishing off Deus here in just a couple of seconds. Um, 1710, again, was the best time that we had in Rise. I think that Mandatory is probably going to be somewhere in the order of about a minute and a half slower than that. Um, Deus gets really fast once you push the boss to 6%. They're actually kind of cooking this boss. So whenever you push the boss to 6%, the dragon aspects actually land on the ground and they start attacking Deus. And you, you see Nose Dormu calling in all those dragon aspects and they do a significant amount of damage to the boss. Mandatory looks like they're even going to kill Deus before... Oh my gosh, they almost beat the 1710 marker. They just really accelerated okay. here. Okay, cool. That was fast. Yes.
So quick there. Victory goes to Mandatory on this one. I mean, we saw a little bit of difficulty on either side, but of course, Mandatory ramping up there and still bringing it home, showing why they are such a high contender and one of the anticipated four to make it to the grand finals. But I mean, as Ronick was even saying, Dratnos, you did an amazing breakdown of Echo's <laughs> Murazond Strat um, that we got to see last weekend. Now we've seen Murazond here with Group B. What were some of your thoughts on this particular run, scuffs and all? Yeah, so first of all, Sanguine and Incorporeal are adding a lot of volatility here. I mean, it's not fair to call this an affix wipe, but I think that the brain power being used on Incorporeal and Sanguine may have explained some of those deaths there and some of the, the problems that Sloth ran into. And then, of course, the big story is just that there is full adoption of basically exactly the Echo plan uh, in bo from both teams, although, of course... Uh, not quite 100% execution of it yet. Uh, that's one of the things that sometimes happens is you see a cool new strat developed and then it actually is just really, there's a lot of hard stuff about learning it, a lot of stuff that can go wrong that you maybe don't see from the team that, that developed the strat, but uh, that instead you'll see, you know, randomly happen where it's like, oh, that's something that can happen with it. Uh, and that's not something you'll immediately know. That's only something you'll learn by practicing the strat a bunch. And even then you just may not get it as consistent as the team that first developed it that you know, really has a, a full plan for everything that might go wrong. I have a question. How efficient do you think that strat is where you're, you're snapping those rift mages See, if you mess that, it up? Uh, that's the crazy part is that Echo were only 17 seconds faster than a more default run uh, yeah. last weekend. I think you could make an argument that, yeah, that Rift Mage strat, like the time you're spending setting up the summons, having your people split up in different sides, standing around and waiting maybe means it's only something like plus 20 seconds, something like that, which, uh, yeah, I mean, it's an incredible amount of work for what sounds like a small amount of time, although with how short our dungeons are, this, this I mean, this is one of our longest dungeons, right? 17-16 is, is a long dungeon this season, and even still, 20 seconds is a huge chunk of that. I mean, yeah, when we have these long ones, you get to see that over the course of it, there is a real chance that things can go wrong or can go really right. I mean, Mandatory picked up their pace as they went through. Almost even with some of the deaths, we're able to get to that time that we saw be competitive with it. So, yeah, talking about things like this Rift Mage strategy, which honestly was so cool to see and so creative and so innovative. Of course, when it comes down to it, a lot of it has to do with just how much time is it actually saving you? As we've talked about a few times today, right? How much time are you getting out of it? And, you know, can you consistently perform it? Because if you can do it every time and you're saving any seconds, great. If you can't, then it's going to be a little bit trickier and might end up costing you. But we do have more ahead of us as well. So Sloth not really showing their best, as we talked about. I mean, Zeronic, you hate to see it when Sloth is such a legend. And really, we know they have the talent on the team. But what do you think might be tripping them up? Up. I don't know. I mean, like we talked about during the cast there, that's a particularly rough part of the dungeon to die in, right? Because it's, it's a weird checkpoint, and if your tank dies, and you, need, and you don't actually get to clear the sand in the area, you have to like go back and clear it again with new trash that you have to then pull, so you just have to pull an extra set of trash that you didn't really plan on pulling before. It really ended up costing them a lot of time. Fortunately for, for Sloth, though, one bad dungeon doesn't just knock you down, right? It's a, it's a best of three, so you can chalk that one up, put it past you, you know, get your spirits back up hype, and show us what you can do in DHT and Ataldazar and potentially take this series. Mandatory is a fantastic team, but Sloth is a team that can definitely compete with them and bring it back here for sure. DHT is incredibly volatile this weekend, too, uh, with it oh, yeah. being sanguine. Like, it, 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 whenever you look at MDI dungeons, anytime you see Sanguine, you just know that that, that dungeon has plus or minus a couple of minutes that can be added. Um, and, like, especially the first couple of pulls of that dungeon are the ones that you're going to need to most watch out for. Like, the bear pulls. If you Sanguine heal a bear, it's just so over. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things that can go wrong in this dungeon <laughs> on Sanguine. Uh, this was my first round match in the MDI, like, global finals, like, six years ago or something and i still have nightmares about sanguine dht this dungeon so much can go wrong with the sanguine affix it's it's not a very easy thing to play around 
No, I mean, Sanguine, as we've talked about, is no matter what, always something that really throws the teams for a loophole. You have to know how to strategize around it. And even in one instant, it can cause a problem for you that, you know, extends into many, many problems, right, over the run. Um, but, I mean, of course, your mandatory and sloth, both very experienced. They come in here for DHT. Uh, we have that to consider. But, I mean, what else do you think they might be? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You know what else we have to consider? An up close of Tuttle's hair who's now one of our official analysts on desk. Tell us hair. Uh, tell, tell us. Yeah. Tell us, yeah. Um, what do you, you know, how would you style this next run, uh, so to speak, in DHT for either team? <laughs> I'm going to take the silence as Tettle's hair responding and waving in the wind. Uh, we'll have to, you know, follow up after this. But for now, we've got game two, Darkheart Thicket coming up. Mandatory versus Sloth. Can Sloth make a comeback here? Can they get off of that slow, slow tree branch they've been stuck on and get moving at a cheetah's pace? We'll have to see as it is. They're going to have to prove it if they want to stay in the competition and not get knocked down to the lower bracket. Tettle's not your hair. Take it away. <laughs> So right off the bat, look at Mandatory here. What they did is they sigil and miseried some mobs, and then Skylark uh, melded off the aggro, and then they group and vis potted up into this uh, near Archdruid Gladius area. I wonder if they're going to do a pull similar to what we saw from like Legendary last weekend, where they were looking to pull all this trash and doing this double bear pack into the boss. Mode actually stealths ahead and is already getting this wall dropped. Look at this, Zyro. The lust has been popped. Oh, yeah. They're posturing to pull straight into the boss. No, I love this, and here's the reason why. That's that pull for legendary was such a ridiculous pull for pretty much one reason to one reason only. They had bolstering in this dungeon the last boss. week, right? And yeah. essentially, like, when you have ten bolstering sacks on the mobs in this dungeon that already do lethal damage with that with without the bolstering, it's gonna one shot you. And that ended, ended up happening in the majority of their pulls. But with this affix set, this pull is so much easier to deal with. And you can see mandatory is doing a great job of kiting this trash around to get as little sanguine healing as possible. When you're pulling twenty mobs like that together on top of a boss and you can get away with less than 10 million Sanguine Healing, yeah, we'll take those every single day of the week. And you can see the efficiency of the pull here. Same trash count, essentially, as Sloth, and they're actually probably going to be even higher with those two Ruiners on top of the boss. And they just have a free 50% amount of boss damage advantage over Sloth. That is a ridiculous yeah. advantage to pull off if you can make that pull work. There was two mob types that they absolutely had to miss sanguine healing. First and foremost, Festerhide Grizzlies cannot be sanguine healing those. Second one, the boss. Like, as long as we... It doesn't matter if we necessarily have 9 million sanguine healing. If none of that's on the boss or those Grizzlies, like, it... It mostly doesn't matter. Like, it's not... It's not efficient, right? Um, if we actually end up sanguining the Nightclaws or whatever. But it's not, like, the end of the world such as, you know, sanguining the boss. And Sloth is actually kind of catching back up. They pulled the boss significantly behind where Mandatory did, but they grabbed the Blossoms, they grabbed that Dryad into the boss as well, and they're kind of catching up. Well, they're going to catch up even faster here because the power infusion just came up, and that's going to be a large burst of damage for them as well. And of course, yes, that means they won't have the power infusion for the next trash pack, but it's going to help them a lot to come back on the boss here. And I wouldn't be surprised to see this gap close to somewhere in the 20% by the time the boss is dead, because mandatory, they don't want to pop any more cooldowns at this point. They want them for their next pull. And yeah, you can see that 50% gap has closed to 25% by the time the boss actually goes down. So Sloth, not necessarily that far behind just yet, but let's see what mandatory can cook up for their next pull, because they do have that power infusion and that combustion coming up so they definitely have room to cook and honestly also from this point as well they'll probably be skipping a majority of this trash using some of that tech that we saw last week and they might even end up having the infernal up for the next pull um, maybe not they're going pretty quick I'm trying to see what exactly they're all pulling so they, it looks like they grabbed the keeper pack it looks like they grabbed that patrolling dryad plus the lasher pull what we've seen teams kind of do sometimes is like drop a misery there's there's a question as to whether or not they're going to be melting off some of this trash but they're playing a lot of dwarves in this area so i don't think that that's something they're going to be doing I, what i kind of anticipate is that skylark left some of those mobs miseried in the back and they're going to kind of trickle in keepers are coming they do have at least one yeah. keeper so i can see that for sure there's actually both keepers it's, both it's keepers both are keepers. here 
Okay, so they are going to have two keepers alive at the very end of the Mode pool. The only thing you have to make sure is that the Night Bears don't go through, but they do. Mode goes down. Actually, died to a Root Burst from Blossom. That's really so unfortunate as well. They did have a Battle Res, but they didn't use it. He released, so he's going to be running back. He'll be able to get here with Stealth. He is a Druid, but that just means they literally cannot have any other mistakes happen here. No Root Burst damage, no cast coming through on the Dwellers. They need to instantly interrupt these Tormenting Eyes, because those do a lot of damage if they're able to go off, and that's good CC usage from the team, even seeing a knockback from the Blast Wave on the Mage yeah. there, just to make sure that they don't take him any extra damage, and at this point, they should be fine. Mode should be back with the team any moment now, and we are in on Oakheart. So the Rupers are actually really hard to see underneath this, like, pebbled ground area, and, and it becomes also doubly difficult once you have those mushrooms kind of coming into the fray where it's kind of difficult to tell if the root burst is beneath your feet or not and so it makes sense as to how mode died I, i'm kind of surprised that they elected to not even use that battle res there they knew that they didn't necessarily need mode that all the damage was going to be avoidable whenever you lose your healer on that kind of pull i feel like i would have been a bit scared especially with like the sanguine healing because the rest of druid does bring typhoon but mandatory just really know their limits now they need to make sure that they don't sanguine heal the boss with those blossoms though Yep, gotta play it safe here. They have knockbacks Ooh. in the form of the Typhoon as well as the Blast Wave, and it looks like uh, Crims might have also actually specced into Greater Blast Wave as well. Those Blossoms are getting pretty close as they drop eight, drop low, though. Skylark's gonna have to do a good job kiting around. So far, so good. There's a massive knockback coming out from the boss, dropping everyone low. Remember, it's tyrannical, so oh, a lot of boss damage here. The oh boss did get one tick of healing. That's <laughs> four million extra damage that they have to do. If you can keep it to just that one tick, you'll be very happy. Look at the HP of those Blossoms in the back as the dots from the Shadow Priest and the Warlock slowly tick them down, but the Blossoms themselves are healing from the Sanguine as well. <laughs> one more Typhoon from Mode trying to knock them back. One more goes down. They just have the one Blossom, but it's also Sanguine healing too, so it's not over for them just yet. Nah, it's funnel, uh, that's funnel. That's that's that's, that's just funnel. That's true, funnel. True, yeah, true. exactly. Mortal coil coming out from Maystein to get it away from the boss, casting root burst. It should die in that cast, and they should be home free from Sanguine. Good execution there from Mandatory. You love to see it. Meanwhile, on the other side, Sloth did deal with essentially all of their trash before engaging with Oakheart, so Sanguine's not going to be something they have to worry about, and they probably will catch up just a little bit in the meantime. But Mandatory pulling the trash on top of the boss really bought them a lot of time. Sloth is a bit lower on counts as well because they pulled the um, the blobs into the boss where I didn't think I didn't think I saw mandatory grabbing those slimes and pulling them into the boss. I think that mandatory is going to be electing to pull those slimes into Dresseron. Um, in addition to that, they have the blood tainted furies that they're going to be grabbing into the boss as well. What you see on the left hand side of your screen here is that Crim is going to be grabbing these blood seekers and then he's going to be getting life gripped up to the Dresseron platform. That allows you to play more count into the boss, which is the most efficient thing. These blood seekers are kind of dangerous because they're not linked to one another. And so, you know, putting a flame striker, actually, probably ignite is going to be the big uh, contributing factor here. So Crims has that ignite spread. There's already a gate placed for him. He's going to gate back up into the dresser run room. And so now we have all the slimes. We have all four bats and the double blood taint to fury on the side of mandatory pulled straight into the boss. Once these slimes go down, you're going to see all defenses being pressed. You got wall up. Um, you have dispersion even potentially even be pressed. Bark scan. Everything is being uh, pressed to make sure that you're not going to die to the slime explosions. And mandatory are arguably through the hard part here. Now they need to make sure that they don't get gunned down by the frontals from the Blood Tainted Furies. But on top of that, any Sanguine that's dropped from the bats or those Blood Tainted Furies also has to be watched out for. Yeah, this is actually a pretty difficult part, right? Those brutal assaults we've seen take down more than enough players Ooh, in the MDI before. Malik but problems for Sloth here. Malak dying on the gather for the pull here. That's going to be a full wipe from them. Anyone in combat is just going to be dead. Maybe they have the melds available, but no. Is Apo in mode actually? Okay, he is. Yeah. yeah Interesting. In oh, he's scared. Ooh. He's waiting for oh. it to run. Oh. Man, that, that, that's a massive time loss from them, though. What can they do here? Malak has to run all the way back. I'm not sure they're, they're not going to be able to get a res off on him, right? So I don't think so. God, this is cool. this is rough. This is just massive <laughs> time loss. <laughs> Apo does not want to move. Okay. <laughs> no. Unfortunate. Yeah, I hate to see it. Another death. Let's get, let's get off the close camp for him. That's mean. <laughs> Poor guy. Meanwhile, Mandatory has finished off the most of their pull, right? They only have Dreseron left. All the bats are dead. All of the blood elementals are dead. They should be easily able to finish off the rest of this boss. And they're, they're way over count. Not, not worrying about it whatsoever. They only need to be at about 79.5% count to make sure yeah. you have the rest of the count you need for the dungeon heading towards the last boss. So they're more than fine here. They could even Can they even skip Thrash? I don't think so, actually. They need to pull it all. You can't skip an entire pack and have enough count, I don't think. Unless they pulled extra. Oh, 
Anyways, they have the count they need. They just got to do one last pull, one last boss. But that last pull is pretty dangerous, and they're not going to have lust for it. They're going, they're going pretty quick. Yeah. So here's one of the advantages of doing this on a 23 tyrannical, is that the trash at the very end is by itself a little bit less scary. So say if you get hunted by that stalker with the dark hunt ability, it's less likely to one shot you 100 to zero. Now the downside of this is since it's sanguine, it's actually kind of hard to do that pack the way you want to do it. Um, you actually, whenever we saw teams last weekend, they would grab all this trash in the log and pull it into um, the final boss in the Shade of Xavius. Whereas we see mandatory on the left-hand side of your screen here, taking it a bit slow because just how you would have to deal with this trash is not super conducive to how uh, Sanguine's going to function in this key. So they're just taking it a little bit slow. They might also have uh, intel that Sloth has wiped and so they know that they don't have to kind of go super ham. I kind of expect them to take these Blood Seekers plus this trash pack into Shade of Xavius though. Yeah, like you said, there's no reason for them to, to risk anything here. They don't need to wait for that trash to funnel in. They're so far ahead with the wipe on Sloth. They, they really don't need to push it here. This is just a smart play. Also, like, not having the Lust available for the pull, too, is like, it's something that is a little scary here with how fast they're going through the dungeon. Okay. So, look at sense. this. They, they actually left the, the hard trash pack at the top with the Summoner, the Imp, yep. and the Stalker, Miseried. And so they're going to leave it in that Misery. And a lot of that's because of Maestine's Infernal. Um, if you see it, it, it'll, it had about 35 seconds remaining whenever the boss got pulled. And so they left them in that 20 second Misery to try to allow that Infernal to come back up so they can have a bit more upfront damage for killing off these trash mobs. Uh, and the Infernal's not even going to be up until three more seconds here, Zyro. Oh my gosh. Mandatory is cooking. It looked like they had something... It was either a pet or something mind-controlled stuck behind the roots there. I didn't quite see what it was. But I don't I don't think in, there's any interesting MC tech here, is there? MC as a Shadow Priest is not typically great because you also lose your pet. You um, slowly. So it's not something that Shadow Priests will do unless it's absolutely required. Uh, Lust has been popped with all offensive CDs on the side of Mandatory as they start just gunning down Shea Xavius. They do have this Deadeye and the Decoy kind of running rampant. But again, it's it's 23 Tyrannical, so these mobs are a lot less dangerous. The Deadeye on Fortified can be a bit sketch with, with his shots, especially mm -hmm. if you're taking other ambient damage from the Shade of Xavius, but it's not too bad. Oh, look at that. They this. also yeah, already actually, have their count, so... The, the Stalker is mind control, but it's mind controlled by Maestein? You will waste away slow. Wait, did he pain. subjugate Demon it? What? Well, that's interesting. I... I don't know what it does. <laughs> I've never seen that before. Uh, I, I need to go I, look at, look up what that does. I also don't know what it does, but I see that it's a minion of the Warlock and it's not a, the yeah, Shadow Maestic. Priest, which is completely different. What does the Stalker do? We need to figure that out. What does Dark Hunt? I just don't map. know what it does. I just don't know what it does when it's MC. So they had bonus count. I think it might just be a situation did, yeah. where it was they had plus one mob on the entire route that they were cooking up, and they're like. What if we just MC'd the Stalker and didn't have to deal with it? Well, that being said, it was enough to take the series for them. Mandatory are going to be moving on over Sloth 2-0. We'll see them in the upper bracket tomorrow. Unfortunately, that does send Sloth to the lower bracket, but they'll be able to battle the way out of it. It's not over for them just yet. It's not indeed. They have another shot at it. And of course, like we've been saying, Sloth has a lot that they can offer and an experienced team. They've just got to figure out what exactly has been tripping them up this time around in the MDIs between the time trials and now here, the performance today. But we had a highly volatile dungeon run here. I would say lots of explosive moments and exciting moments. So Dratnos, why don't you go ahead and break down some of what you saw for us as we went through this? Yeah, I mean, this was a rough one for Sloth again. We have another seven death run that they've uh, they've had here. You can see they're still working on Shade of Xavius, but yeah, it looks like now they they've uh, probably been told that it, it is actually yeah okay yeah because they because mandatory have a hundred percent count. Okay, I was I was wondering why we were still on this screen, but I almost got baited as thinking it's because we didn't have count, but no, it's all good. Situation normal. Yeah, um, interesting run though for Sloth. I. It's tough, right? Because like this has happened now in both of their games. So, is this a huge sign of weakness for them? You know, because I, I would worry that Sloth in this state they would have they would have lost last series as well to um, like they would have lost to the lower seeded teams in the other series we've seen as well with with a run like this. So, uh, on the other hand, maybe maybe you're taking the idea of we're not going to beat mandatory, right? We're not going to try and beat mandatory or perplexed. We're going to try and make it to Sunday 
through the lower bracket and uh, we're going to prep those series and maybe that means you don't have dark heart uh, or rise in there you don't prep those as much those were both sanguine dungeons so uh, maybe that as well that that affix is inherently very volatile so maybe they just uh, got some bad bad luck in both runs and uh, those were abnormally bad i'm not sure Jonas, did that did that stalker go beast mode or like what actually happened with the thing we're, uh, I, I am not sure, so I looked into it a little bit, okay. and I could see that the Stalker only has that one ability, right? It only has that hunt ability, and I believe it can only cast it if it's outside of melee range of the target. Correct. Um, yeah. I'm trying to get into the logs and see how much damage it actually did, but I don't have that number yet, so uh, I'm see. not sure, but I'm, it does a lot of damage to players, so I wouldn't be surprised if it did a lot of damage to bosses as well. I'm just kind of thinking about it from the eye test. I feel like it, the only reason that they would MC it is if was like for count purposes. Plus, that mob is not great on Sanguine, but maybe maybe it does do a lot of damage. It might be one of those things that well, uh, what it does a bit more. What than I was intended. thinking, what I was thinking is that it could just be a safe play, right? Because that's probably the most dangerous mob. You have to be spread out in phase two of that fight because there's a lot of movement. You don't want a stalker jumping around meleeing people for eighty percent of their HP. Maybe you just use your Warlock subjugate on it, because let's be honest, as a Death Warlock, your pet doesn't really do anything. If you don't have to interrupt anything, there's no reason for you to have your Fell Hunter out, so just taking any pet that does melee damage is essentially the same DPS, so just removing a mob from the encounter is probably totally acceptable. Yeah, the, I mean, those stalkers are how you die, right? Like, they do yes. so much damage, and they, they force you to be within eight yards of them if you don't want them jumping at you, which means you have to kill them off before you can then spread and do the mechanics, or you just accept that it's going to be doing that damage to random players. So, yeah, I mean, that, that theory might make sense as well. It may also have done decent damage on its own. I'm not sure. I'll, uh, I'll let you know if I find out. Well, we'll see. And we have a bit of a hold right now, everyone. So don't worry. But I mean, here we are in, you know, looking at the logs, looking over everything, wondering about some of these strats that we saw. I mean, obviously with this, the uh, sanguine affix and with the other affixes that we had, DHT was particularly, particularly dangerous uh, this go around. But for both of these teams, I mean, they navigated through it as best they could. I mean, is this one that we think that we might see uh, more of later today? Is this something where we think that this is going to be proving a problem for other teams uh, if they come up against, particularly these affixes, Tuttles? I, I mean, obviously these affixes are very volatile with like Valk Sanguine. Um, I think the I think that it's a lot front loaded into the first pull though. And with a lot of the difficulty of the entire dungeon being front-loaded in the first pull, MDI teams historically do really well with those kinds of like difficulty checks because they it's just so easy to volume practice the first pull, right? You get that double bear into Archdruid Gladius, and while that is in isolation a very difficult pull, if you you know have a bunch of attempts on it, so you say. So throw 30 to 40 attempts at it, eventually you're going to be able to start getting it consistent and lower the opportunity for Sanguine Healing to kind of ruin your day. Mm. All right, yeah. so uh, Zyro has, has gotten some information back. It is just to avoid the damage. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for looking into that. Uh, and, sleuthing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's still clever. So, you, I mean, you're giving up not too much of the Warlock pet for doing that, but uh, you're getting, yeah, basically to delete a whole enemy. It doesn't mean you have to add a little bit more count earlier in the dungeon, but that's not that hard, right? There are some extra mobs sitting around that you can grab uh, into the various poles. I think they grabbed yeah. extra blossoms behind the... Uh, yeah, exactly. Like, that's totally fine, right? They also killed the two keepers, right? You could technically remove both of those from the route, and they would have still had 100% count if you killed off the stalker. But because they kept because they killed the two keepers... They just didn't need the stalker. And that makes mm -hmm. perfect sense. Like I was talking about a couple of expansions ago for Affliction and Destro, they normalized pet DPS across the board so that regardless of what pet you had out, as long as they had full uptime, they would do the same damage. And like that's why you see a lot of high-end locks when they play Affliction and Destro on in like raid encounters, they'll use an imp because technically your imp has a high range, so it should sh it should always be casting, so it'll technically be better than like a fell hunter that has to run around after things. In a dungeon, you'll always be running Fell Hunter because you want an interrupt, of course. Um, but like, like we were talking about, on Shade of Xavius, there's nothing to interrupt. And once all of the interrupt trash is dead, you don't need your Fell Hunter. Just mind control something or subjugate demon. It, I guess is the correct way to say it for a warlock. 
Yeah, it's cool tech. Smart, smart to make that pull less Could, dangerous. Couldn't you just banish it? I guess then you'd have to recast banish at some yeah, point. Yeah, subjugate is, is five minutes, if I remember properly. Yeah, so it's we only used, one We used to cast. use this tech all the time back in Arcway when you could uh, take control of a mob in there and give a haste buff that it had to, your, to yourself or your teammates. And it lasts five minutes, so it's a lot better than the, just the 30-second banish. Hmm. You know, it's ironic hearing you talk about some of the changes over the years, particularly with the dungeons that we've seen before or that obviously have come back just for this season. I mean, there is a lot that has changed between their initial sort of releases and now what we're seeing in the current MDI. I don't know, Zeronic, is there anything in particular that you think uh, with any of the dungeons that are here in our current pool that has really been a noticeable change from the original strats versus today's strats? Uh, people are a lot better now. <laughs> like, a lot <laughs> better. Uh, if you go back and watch MDIs even, like, four years ago, there were a lot of matchups where there would just be, you know, wipe fests, right? You'd have 10 to 20 deaths per dungeon per team. E even worse than that sometimes. But nowadays, that's very out of the norm. I mean, how many dungeons have we had that they go over 10, 10 deaths? Just one, actually, right? It was the Black Recold. And even then, that was an anomaly for, for the teams. They, they just had a really bad mistake cascade in effect. In general, the dungeons... I mean, the dungeons really haven't changed much. It's more about how the players interact with the dungeons, right? Like, they, they're they better at figuring out how to group things together. They're better at stacking their damage cooldowns better. They're better at spacing things out, essentially. And that's really just been kind of like, you know, watching one team do it really good throughout the years, kind of seeing how they do it, figure out their strategies, and do it like them. I think Echo's kind of leading the competition, leading the charge for players to get better. And we're finally having teams reach up and kind of grasp that same level of, of skill as Echo. Like, this mandatory team is definitely a team that can compete with them. And it's taken them a couple of years to get there, a couple of iterations of their players. Adding Skylark was a huge boon for them. The guy's a beast on the tank, and this team has gotten so much better with him on it. I think, you know, after seeing this series from them... I'm I'm pretty impressed with them. I, I'm I'm really looking forward to see what kind of cool strategies they can come up with the dungeons that we haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of potential there. And like we said, we're always looking for who is going to actually really rival Echo in the MDI. It feels like it's a continuous thing every year. Echo is the one that, of course, most other teams are measured by, even as they accomplish a lot of things themselves and even introduce tech or runs into the scene um, that are still just as valuable. But I mean, with Mandatory in particular, uh, very interesting seeing them come in. And Sloth, you know, who we thought was going to be a really big contender given their experience, but who has just struggled to kind of find their flow this particular season. Um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about some of the compositional things this particular season. And I mean, I'm curious, you know, Tettles, uh, you know, a lot of these teams are trying to bring a lot of different things to the table. We've had the four DPS, we've had all kinds of stuff. But over the course of Dragonflight and the MDIs that we've had, how do you think that the compositional scene has changed? Um... I think historically teams have gone for like large AOE compositions and what is different from this MDI compared to previous MDIs is like a lot of the times they go for like the the max AOE, right? So they would in this in this season for example they'd potentially be playing like Unholy Death Knight plus Havoc Demon Hunter plus a third if they were going for like full on largest AOE. The texture of these dungeons is a lot different in the sense of priority damage and um, a lot of funnel is, is arguably the most important thing that you're seeing in a lot of these keys. And that's why things like the Fire Mage and the Shadow Priest are so valuable. Because they're doing full AoE while doing m arguably more single target or like full single target to a trash mob. Um, and so they're able to kind of nuke it down. Like, like you saw in the Dark Art Thicket, if you wanted to prio down those Fester Hide Grizzlies or potentially even like the boss in like the first pull this composition allows you just a lot more leeway. And then where the Destro Warlock fits in is, first off, it's a great uh, person that gets PI. Uh, Arcane Intellect is great on them, but also it does just enough AoE to kind of carry your group. Mm -hmm. Everyone, we are just uh, sitting tight for a little bit here while some things happen behind the scenes. So as we continue to chat, you know, feel free to give us your thoughts as well on how you felt about the season of MDI, uh, you know, all that this has encompassed in Dragonflight. Um, we'll keep chatting here. I mean, I know we can talk 
endlessly about the scene. And I mean, Dratnos, you've had some amazing <laughs> insights about uh, so many things from the runs to the strats that we've seen broken down to the teams that are playing. You know, we've had kind of a shift up in the MDI and TGP. So we've been switching off now every season. Um, and I'm curious, how do you think that this new pacing kind of keeps things fresh for the scene? Uh, and, it, you know, what do you think is good about this change? I, okay, I love MDI, but I really love TGP as well. So I'm really excited that Base. we get to kind of alternate between both of them. <laughs> um, they're just both so great as well. They highlight such different parts of the of the game. Because Keep going. You know, if you think about it, right, we're watching these keys, 23s, 24s, 25s, run once where it's all about, like, digi-wipe. And then we'll get to do TGP as well in a couple months where it'll be 10 key levels higher and, you know, a team like Sloth that maybe has a, a higher volatility but maybe a higher, maybe the ability to do the key just as well, like, they'll still be able to... Uh, you know, it'll come down to, like, whether you can do the key rather than can you do it the first time, which those are both such interesting skills to uh, to look at. And, uh, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm just a huge fan of the fact that we've got both now because they're both great. I I mean, I would love to have both of them every season, but alternating is uh, is great, too. So to give a little bit of insight of what's, what we've been waiting for, we were kind of looking at something in Mandatory's run there. Uh, Admins have been looking into it for a little bit here. That's why we've been delayed here for a little while. But while we're on this DPS and HPS graph, uh, something really stands out at me about the peak of the purple peak on the very far left of that DPS graph. If you notice, it goes a little bit higher than the yellow peak, which means that the purple team did a little bit more burst DPS than the yellow team did. That means they, they, they pulled a little bit more mobs, and they aoe just a little bit harder. And that's something that you can really derive from this graph here. Oh, more damage, more better, then, is sort of what uh, you're saying, Zeronic. Absolute chatter moment right here. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That is an expert now. <laughs> That's really good. No, I love this. This helps break down the, the image for us so that we can understand that when something goes higher, it is more versus the other ones where they're lower and it might be less. And uh, thank you for that insight. Really profound there. Uh, no, I mean, honestly, <laughs> honestly, though, there's really good feedback about that. And Dratnos, I love what you were saying about TGP versus MDI because you're right. There's so many different ways that the content in the game shines when put into these kind of competitive modes and being able to alternate between them we get to see i mean even today as we've been talking about you know sanguine is so difficult as an affix in this style of tournament um because of many of the challenges that come with these sort of speed runnings and going through that um and so it's really great to get to see how all of this kind of gives us a bigger picture of the many ways that you can engage with the content within world of warcraft but i mean of course this season it has brought a lot of competition we've had some really really fantastic competitors uh even with you know the sort of discussions happening behind the scenes i mean uh Tettles, what has been your highlight out of both group a and group b so far here in this mdi Okay, so um, we do have information from the admins here about that match. During the match, Mandatory used a strategy that was not pre-approved by admins ahead of the run, and therefore the run was nullified, which awards Sloth the win in match two, and therefore we're moving on to game three with the series tied one to one. So a little unfortunate, but the rules are the rules, and we're heading into a Taldazar next. Yeah, this is... Basically, we've had this rule for the past uh, few... I guess years now, yeah. uh, where teams are generally allowed to use a lot of different strategies, but you have to check with the admins if you're doing anything that falls under a list of various different types of, uh, of strats, you know, stuff like that, that echo strategy we saw in the rise actually that both teams used here was, you know, submitted and pre-approved. Um, but even stuff like pulling things through walls, uh, going ahead of the dungeon where you're not supposed to be, uh, those kind of things, you generally, those will get approved uh, depending on exactly what they are. Sometimes they don't, uh, but mm -hmm. they always have to be checked with the admins just to make sure that we have, you know, a fair playing field. Right. And, uh, that didn't happen, I guess, this time. So that's going to bring us uh, to game three here. Always unfortunate when something like that happens. But I think it's been a really good rule change ever since it's been made. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a huge wrench, though, thrown in the series. Yeah, it definitely encourages open communication between the player and the admins. And you won't have any weird things that happen where, like, you know, a team completely breaks a dungeon and everyone everyone's watching feeling like something outside of fair play just happened. So... We really like how this has worked for the past, you know, couple of couple of seasons that we've done. 
Mm-hmm. It's great. I mean, it makes sure that everybody's on board. Everybody has, you know, all the same information, at least behind the scenes, right? Of course, the teams keep these private because they want a lot of those strategies, tactics, and tech to stay hidden. But, um, you know, here with this, unfortunate that Mandatory, who had a clean run on that, just didn't have one of those strategies pre-approved. Um, as it is, though, this does go ahead and give Sloth an opportunity here in the upper bracket to stay up <laughs> here to fight it out and to kind of push ahead so i mean tells i hear you i hear you kind of chuckling off to the side but i mean do you think that sloth can pull it back here and uh, maybe even take this match well this would be a colossal bailout if they are um yeah i think that the issue for sloth for me has been they've just not been consistent uh their, their strats that they're doing are pretty fast i i think that they're they have potential to even be able to get top four this weekend with the strats that they're doing. But the issue is that they just like continue to make minor mistakes that's causing them to wipe, right? Like Malik getting meleeed to death without his cheat death available is like it happens to literally every Vintage Demon Hunter who's played this season. It literally just happens while you're gathering mobs, uh, especially if you're getting meleeed behind by the slimes. But like you have to make sure that it doesn't happen and that you can you can prevent that by obviously pressing your fell dev a little bit earlier. You press your you press your meta while you're running. And it's one of those situations that if Sloth can make sure they don't have any of those just like minor oopsies or minor mistakes that cascade into like a large issue, I think that they could timer wise be very, very close to mandatory, which is if you're if you're in mandatory's position, you kinda have to be kicking yourselves a little bit that it's even going to a game three. I mean, it is definitely not what you want to have to see happen here, but we will be going into this game three, which will be Atal Dazar, mandatory versus Sloth here. They see which one of them will take the victory and continue on in the upper bracket. Zeronic, would you like to lead us into uh, this lovely dungeon? Yeah, absolutely. Love Atal Dazar. Mainstay great dungeon of both just the game and the MDI in general. Definitely a fun one to watch, and it's been just as good as it was back in BFA so far throughout this cup. Extremely quick times, massive pulls, quick dungeon, a lot going on, but really doesn't allow for that many mistakes. And for a team that assumed that they were already up 2-0 in the series and moving on to the upper bracket, Mandatory has to bring it together and clutch it out here in this game three. And Sloth is... they are given a new lease on life here, obviously, like we just mentioned, right? Yeah. For all intents and purposes, they, they should be... Move down to the lower bracket, but if they have a good Ataldos are cooked up here, they could they could walk away with a with a steal here. I got some uh times. So whenever we saw Perplex versus Bone Buds in series one in Ataldazar, Perplex was able to finish this dungeon in nine minutes and eighteen seconds. So that is the time that both Mandatory and Sloth are gonna be looking to beat. Um obviously they're competing versus one another, but just to really kinda show how strong their Ataldazar is for themselves and for, you know, practice later on. They'll, they'll know that that 918 is definitely a, a good benchmark for a solid Ataldazar run this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is going to be our first good comparison as well, right, between Perplex run and some of our other top-end teams running the Ataldazar too. Perplex is already pretty quick. I mean, very impressive how quickly their run went, but, I mean... <laughs> You know, Perplex is a team that we really okay. don't give enough credit. I feel like for the past couple of for the past couple of years, because they really haven't showed up when they need to. Right? They've they've kind of fallen to the lower ranks in the global finals when we expect them to top two or top three. But you know, at the end of the day, they still are probably our our most storied team outside of Echo in the MDI. Okay, I know we've been on the screen for a while, and you and I've been talking. So apparently. Mm -hmm. You know the you know the the neutral mobs like the the critters that surround the <sighs> keystone. Do they infernal it? In its Haldazar. Yeah. So what you really want to do with uh. the lock is pre-infernal. However, <laughs> uh, what accidentally happened, I think, for one of the teams is somebody's infernal hit the critter, obviously combating them, meaning that the key can't start on time, and so we're we're having a a short remake between the two instances. It's not even that big of a deal. We're gonna get this map underway probably in a short period of time. Not not too much longer, yeah. I don't think. We want to make sure that both of them start their key at roughly the same time, you know, within a second of each other, so it actually at least no. looks like it, a race, it, right? It'd be a little weird if a team started the key, like, an extra minute later than the other. If it wasn't a Warlock Infernal on a critter, it would be a Demon Hunter metting a, a critter, yep. or a Moonkin stuck in combat with a turn-up punching bag, you know, things that happen to everybody. Oh, there's always something at the start it's of the It's always something, that... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get into the map any minute now. Just gotta... Reset everything up, get the teams in the new reset dungeons. Yeah, what, what do you expect for Lust? Good to go. 
Do you expect first pull? Uh, uh, it's tough to say, um, because the general fastest strat and safest strat that we saw all of last week was the mini bosses on top of uh, Razan, right? But we saw Perplex do something completely different. They just lost it on their first pull on the left side, and they had a pretty insane time. So I don't know. I don't know if the affixes necessarily constitute doing something different than what we saw in Group A, but. Let's see what Mandatory and Sloth opt to do here. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see either one of those two options. Both of those seem to be like the premier um, best things to do. It's a bit different. Okay, so whenever we saw it last weekend, it was it was obviously tyrannical, which makes the trash pulls a lot easier. Um, on Fortified, the, the first couple of pulls, though, with those augers and the confessors, if you don't get them CC'd perfectly uh, with either things like, you know, Infernal Stun or, or Shadow Fury or Silent Sigil, obviously being the predominant ones, uh, something can go wrong very quickly, which is typically, I think, why we're going to see Bloodlust on those first pulls with it being Fortified and the trash living a little bit longer. But mm -hmm. it'll, I, I, I think a mid pack Lust might be on the table as well. It's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, it's definitely hard to say. And really, I mean, talking about the decisions in the dungeon, there's not a whole lot of decisions to make when you only have nine minutes to get from a start of a run to a clean run, but we are in the dungeon. Both teams have started Double the key, priest. and we are off to the races here. Double Priest coming out from Mandatory. That's a second Master Spell for the team, but it's also a second Power Infusion, so you would assume that the damage is going to be relatively high from the DPS players. That being said, Resto Druid does pump out a lot of its own damage here, so mm -hmm. it's actually interesting to see what the damage difference is going to be, but we're already seeing differing strategies off the bat. Mandatory straight heading to Razan first, getting the snapping. Lust on cooldown. Do they have the mini-boss pack in here? I believe we do. Yep, there they are. They're getting snapped I'm down now, so they're going to be using the Lust there. Here we go. I'm really worried about this mid-pack resetting. Okay, so they actually have the Dynamancer snapping in late. Okay, this is fine. How that mid-pack works, how the uh, snapping the mid-pack works, by the way, is like you have to sigil a flame every single mob that's in the mid-pack before you jump down, or it has to be like tagged by you before you're able to jump down and even snap it down. And I've seen like that pack reset, and it's it could easily, very easily reset the boss if you don't do it perfectly. I was kind of worried that mandatory there uh, might have made a mistake. Oh, look at dude, the mid, the mid pack reset. Mozu, <laughs> Mozu went back and came oh. back down. Oh my god, it, it, see, this is what I was talking about. Oh, dude, it's full <laughs> reset, which means all of them go back to 100% HP. The so that is reset. really got... unfortunate. Okay, okay the, yeah, the, the boss. At least reset. the boss didn't reset. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. Of course, one of the other strategies we're seeing being used here in this Ataldazar is something that people have shown on live. Wait a minute, what's the damage coming out on the group here? Mode goes down to a dead eye aim. Are they going to expend the battle res? I think they have to because the bursting is going to start to sack when these mobs die on the group. Battle res is there. Mode is not Ooh. taking it quite yet. Maybe he's waiting for something. Maybe he's waiting to see if he can just release when the boss dies instead. I think that's what the plan is going to be. He cancels the battle res and now is going to like release. They are taking damage still from the mini boss here. Every single one of these quick shots hitting one of these clothies for a ton of their HP. This is still very dangerous for them, and it's a lot of lost time for them too. I'm not worried about the danger of getting shot here, per se. I'm really more annoyed about the time loss uh, that we've incurred here with this mid-pack resetting. That's really bad. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look on the right side of your screen, Sloth playing a more conventional route. They had a death in their first pull, which we didn't necessarily highlight, but it's not like the end of the world. Uh, they're pulling all of this trash onto Priestess Alunza. They're going to be getting it killed off. They actually use a bunch of dwarves and a massive spell to be able to remove those stacks of bursting. And Sloth, I think, had the the upper hand over Mandatory as Mandatory has another death on Maystein. Simpkins cauterizing to this transfusion cast, but he's just barely going to be kept alive by Mickey there. Great healing coming up from the rest of okay. the last second to make sure no deaths come off the board. Sloth did have a death early on in their trash, but it wasn't uh, I... worth a battle res. They were able to just release into so, so the group. Mandatory is still in this trash bag. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, they're taking forever to finish it off. I mean, it reset when it was at like 50% HP. They have to kill it. And the thing is, when you when it comes to these strategies in the dungeons, you have pre-set up cooldowns yes. for the trash pulls that yes. you're doing. They can they could not have they they, they couldn't have used, reused cooldowns there because they already have them allocated towards their next trash pull. So they're just going to be killing that trash with no cooldowns, and that's why it took them so long. It probably took them an extra like minute and a half just to deal with that trash. Actually, yeah, you can see on the boss two timer they killed Razan literally a minute and. A a half ago. That's how much oh time God, that cost died. them. Problems for Sloth, though, on their on their pull for Razan Simkins, without the cauterize from the pr that was used on the previous pull, he doesn't go end up going down during the snap of the trash to Razan here. Now Apo oh. goes down as well, and they don't have the battle res. They just use it on Simkins. Sloth, dude, Razan is just claiming lives right now. Oh, gosh. Well, it's, more, it's, more, it's more the trash, but, you know, I they're can't... pulling it with Razan, so... 
Oh, oh no, Malik dropping. Sloth... Yeah, okay. So look at this. The Razan reset. Oh, so the reset. Sloth... Sloth didn't have the Dynomancer. So very similar to what happened to Mandatory. And I was I was looking for it. Sloth didn't have the Dynomancer snap from the mid pack. And so whenever you have those mixed snaps, sometimes it, what happens is what happened to Mandatory, where it snapped back up and then snapped back down at full health. However, for Sloth, they had the worst version of this possible, where the boss resets whenever you mess it up. And I, where's their Dynomancer? Where is the Where is their Dynomancer? It's still upstairs. Merciless Assault from the Juggernauts is just taking people out in addition to the charges coming out from the Dinos as well. This is brutal for Sloth here. And you know what? This is kind of what you engage when when you choose to snap in your runs. One of the long-standing rules of the MDI is, you know, if you can snap it, you can go for it. But some of the weird buggy things that snapping does to the game are going to be the result of what you do, and you just have to be okay with that. And teams have accepted that contract and are willing to play with it. And they know most of the things that make snapping go wrong. You know, typically speaking, you know, being next to walls can bug mobs out and make them evade reset. It can reset bosses. And we've actually seen both of those things happen to our two different teams here. We'll have to see which one ends up costing them the most time. Sloth has now re-engaged Razan with all of their trash dead. It's just going to be a single target burst. It looks like Mandatory is going to be getting the better of this one as they have way more trash count. And Priestess Alunza is going to die way before Razan does. I think Mandatory's in a convincing lead now after the Razan reset, but I'm not... I'm not positive, I guess. Yeah, they're gonna be way ahead. Priestess Lenza dies during this transfusion. Everyone is still alive, and look at the trash count differential. Mandatory 20%, is and it's count. gonna be even more. They still have a Juggernaut alive. Yeah, they, they are very, very so, much in the lead right now. Now they just have one Sard pack, I think, with... Or it might be two Sard packs. And then they have the Witch Doctor packs um, with the Stalkers, and I think that's it. Yeah, they are pretty much pretty much done. They actually have so much trash count. They, they might only have just the one pull here at, at the bottom of the staircase, right, with the Stalkers and the Witch Doctors. I, think, I don't think they even have to pull Skyscrammers into Yasma. I think they just have the one. I think this will be it. That being said, Sloth is on oh. the heels of Mandatory. Wait, no, 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 is Mandatory skipping? It looks like they might be. All of their players going past the trash, pulled Ew. by Skylark here. Shadow Melt's being used to make sure they're dropping combat. Skylark also drops the combat, and they're just going straight into Volcal. Maybe they are just doing that Skyscreamer plus Sword pull into, into Yasma. Well, in addition to that, they can also grab some of this trash through the gate, right? We saw... Right, with the Ammo Aura, yeah. We, we, we saw Perplexed earlier, you know, they, they walked up against the wall with the Ammo Aura active on their, their tank, and they just kind of rubbed against it, and then the trash came all the way through. Um, ooh. Wait, one of those totems is really high. Uh, they should okay. be fine. They're fine. Yeah, it dies pretty quick. It's, it's a pretty, no. pretty low-key level. Fine. It's fortified. They should be able to burn through that quickly. Now, if it was at like 40%, I'd be like, because, mm -hmm. you know, you have three casters that have to kind of have to ramp their damage a little bit, but they're going to be okay here. Going to uh, start dealing with phase two of Volcal. Meanwhile, Sloth, with that 20% less count that they had on the board after their second boss kill, they do have to deal with this trash pack that Mandatory just skipped, so they're going to be losing more and more time as Mandatory starts to burn through Volcal here. Yeah, Volcal down to 50% HP. Um... There are a couple of other trash mobs that they can grab to kind of finish off their enemy forces. I think what's expected is that they're going to be pulling them into Yasma, right? I don't think that that... I assume that they're going to grab the 13% enemy forces into Yasma. I think that makes the most sense here. 13 is a lot, though, because the a, most that, that we've seen lot. pulled is into there... Yasma... Yeah, nor, like, normally we see... The most we've seen pulled into Yasma is, I think, three Skyscrammers plus a Sword Pack, which is, like, a little over uh, 8%, I think. I, I've, seen, I've seen double... I've seen double uh, Sword Pack plus two Skyscrammers, and that was about 8%, yeah. I don't think it's I've about seen about 8% as well. So what is Mandatory going to do for their trash count here? Let's see, as they group up on their mounts here, they're going to have to get past this trash once again using the same strategy. They don't have the shadow mounts this time, but they don't have to pop them instantly. They can wait until they come back off cooldown. Even, even, or are they just going to pull this into Yasma? Oh. No, that's the invis from Crims. No, that's the invis from Crims. They're definitely everybody not playing. Everybody's going to for like another t two seconds? Okay, everybody's They just, they just all pressed. popped it, yeah. Okay. All right. Machine isn't here to drop the gateway, but I guess they don't need to drop the gateway if they're planning on pulling this trash, necessarily. They really just need their priest to get to the top so they can grip everyone up. Whenever mobs reset as well, I wonder if any like sards reset. Like, True. There's also there's also a question of is this the right amount of count that we're supposed to be taking out of the boss? Mm. Yeah, they could have they could have had some extra mobs not come down on their initial snap that that snapped the uh, the mini boss back, right? There could be some 
some trash mobs with that mini boss patrol. Yeah, we'll that, see, that we'll didn't see. snap with them. Skylar's we'll posturing. Yeah, Skylar's posturing to grab whatever mobs are coming through. Uh, whenever they they come through that gate, making sure that he's getting like mm. ammo aura and being able to tag them immediately. Oh, yeah, it is. It is an casters auger from pack. the first bowl. An auger pack, yeah. Interesting. Okay, is this the pack that they skipped past through with Mindsuit at the very beginning of the dungeon? I think it was the pack at the bottom of the gate. Okay. Well, um, it's getting burned we're... down by their cooldowns, so... no problem whatsoever. It doesn't seem to be too big of an issue. They do have some new skyscrapers as well that are pretty high HP. That's two extra interrupts they have to worry about, but. Looks like they're dealing with it pretty cleanly. They've got their count. These last two skyscrapers will finish off that count, and all they have to do is finish off the 30% of the Asma. Yeah, just looking at it, it looks like the pack was double Honor Guard, double Augur, double Skyscraper, double Sarid pack, which is... Okay. That's a lot of mobs. <laughs> but it's very efficient to actually be doing with the boss. And look at this. The Skyscraper and Yasma have approximately the same amount... Of not amount, but the same percentage of HP remaining. Um, both of those things do need to die for the, the dungeon to be completed by mandatory. Again, the timer that we were looking at was about 9.10 from what we saw from Perplexed earlier. However, mandatory had a, a major blunder at the very beginning with some of those mobs resetting. But mandatory going to be able to down this dungeon in 9 minutes and 58 seconds and take the series 2-1. to one. But man, that was a bit closer than they wanted. It was good to see Mandatory coming in to solidify this even after the ruling gave that second game over to Sloth. They have absolutely, indisputably earned their place here in the upper bracket. And although Sloth, again, had a little bit of a rough showing today and in the time trials, they will be going down to the lower bracket and it would be great to see them make a comeback, find their sort of rhythm and get back into the swing of it with all of their experience here in the MDI. Now, Dratnos, obviously we had some whiffs with, you know, some of the snapping. We had some things that kind of did not go as planned, but what were you kind of seeing as you watched through this one? Yeah, the middle pack... You know, Razan nonsense. I, I was trying to figure out exactly what caused this, and I think it may have been a storming. I think you may, we may have seen, like, a storming leading to a mob not being able to draw a path, leading to it resetting, something like that. I mean, it's it's a, um, it's a bizarre thing to happen, a very unfortunate thing to happen, but luckily for Mandatory, the, uh, the boss was also very difficult there. You could see Talanja just kind of drifting over, and... Uh, Taking out Apo there, so... Yeah, I mean... I think some of this... Genuinely, I think that some of this is like storming makes this pull really difficult. Um, I think we had storming on this same dungeon last week, we if did. I'm not mistaken, as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm surprised we didn't see any teams last week have problems and then both teams this week having that problem, but uh, really just, <laughs> just goes to show that... Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on that you don't notice when it goes right, and <laughs> storming is certainly one of them. I, I was testing out, like, snapping that mid-pack, and it's basically an issue of, like, you have to make sure that every single mob is tagged in that mid-pack with the Sigil of Flame, and then you jump down immediately. And if you, like, miss a tag on any of the mobs, it doesn't port, and then the the, the worst thing possible happens. It ports back up or potentially resets Razan, right? Which is what happened for Sloth and what also happened in a different way to Mandatory. Well, something else we need to cover as well is, like, just how fast this run actually could have been, right? Because how much time do we think they lost due to half to finishing off that trash after they killed off Razan? It was something in the realm oh, of a dude, minute, right? Because they were standing there forever. <laughs> and their overall timer was a 9.48, so is mm. the sub-9 in the realm of possibility for the mandatory strat? Like, Because that looked really, really clean. It does seem like it could be a possibility with them. I mean, we've seen that timer on Atal just get lower and lower. I mean, even just last weekend with Group A, the moment where everybody was like, oh, are we going to get sub 10? And now we're watching as it just continues to creep down towards that nine minute marker. I think mandatory has it in them. But I mean, of course, that was a huge amount of time having that reset still being on the mob. But all the rest of it seems to go pretty smoothly for them. So if they hadn't had that one issue, I think they would have been able to really push through it. I mean, even so, they were able to still take this one um, and stay here in the upper bracket. But, I mean, it would have been a great, amazing run to see just how low they could have gotten it there, Tettles. I think sub-9 is doable with a perfect run. I, I think it's one of those situations that you do have to have a near-perfect run to be able to get it to sub-9 on this week's Athic set at this level. Um, but it definitely seems like it's doable. Personally... I don't know how the, uh, my other casters feel. 
I think that Ataldazar is probably one of the best designed dungeons for the MDI. Like, every single time that we've seen it, it is always just, like, so cool. And it's something about how fast and how action-packed it is. Every single pull is, is just, like, this massive thing. And it kind of culminates into, like, a four-pull dungeon where every single one of them is, like, super intense. I always love watching Ataldazar. Yeah, me too. This this dungeon is such a banger. Like, as well, you have the strategic differences that we see so much of in here, right? Are you going Razan first? Are you going left first? We don't usually see right first, but you know it is an option. And uh, and how much are you pulling at once? Are you pulling which packs are you pulling onto which bosses? Which mobs are you skipping? It's a incredibly wide open field in terms of of what strategy you can bring to it. So, yeah, great dungeon. Great dungeon and lots of ways to tackle it. I mean, it is one of the ones that really shines here in this format, completely agree. Um, and as we can see here, we have all of our bracket. We are coming up on what will be our last match of the day, Bald Bandits, and come on now as we determine who will be here in the quarterfinals. Of course, we've also filled out that lower bracket because again, this is a double elimination. And although each of these have been best of threes, these teams will have another chance tomorrow to try and make their way up and secure one of the four spots going on to the grand finals, let alone crowning a champion for the Group B weekend. Uh, tomorrow's when it's going to get pretty intense because the groups will also be unfortunately excluded from the competition at that point as well. But of course, Sunday will be our big championship day. So we hope that you will all enjoy throughout the rest of the weekend. Uh, we still have one more to go. And before that, we actually have a little mini game here. So we can kind of have a palate cleanser, you know, after the after the stumbles and the delays, we can come in. Uh, we've been doing these dungeon movement map sections here where we ask that all of us here on the desk and you in the audience try to guess the dungeon boss based on the movement of the players. This is footage that's been captured and played in this season mythic dungeon international and it'll be one of four bosses which you'll see listed at the bottom of the screen that are a possibility for which run it is so we'll see what this one has we've got what oak heart with a bark shade of zavius dress run okay all right all right what are you all thinking so it's not shade <laughs> immediately not shade how's <laughs> it I was going to say, I could see it being dressed wrong, but that doesn't make too much sense with how much the, the druid and the, the priest are moving. Is it ever Oakheart? I think it's Witherbark, actually. Witherbark? Yeah. Uh, aren't they usually stacked up on Witherbark, though? Mm, okay, yeah. I think the tank would I'm be just thinking. I think the tank would be moving a bit more on Oakheart because they have trash typically pulled into the boss, right? I mean, they're moving yeah. quite a bit now. It's it's one moving. of the tree bosses. I'm ready to. <laughs> yeah. What to launch a guess? Mm. Which one? Your tank would tree not boss. be moving out of the corner if it was Witherbark. I'm gonna say Oakheart. No, I think would. it's Oak. I think it's Oak. Your tank wouldn't be on the same side as your DPS if it was Oakheart. Uh, oh, I guess the boss could be over on the left of the tank right now. It's possible. I don't know. I'm 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 pretty sure it's uh it's Witherbark. I'm guessing Oakheart. Oh, oh. I, I didn't mean for that. Right under the wire. As, <laughs> as a group, as a group of casters, I I, I like Dratnos' answer, so we'll go with Dratnos. So we're still three for three. Let's go. Yay! Tree boss as well. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. This has been such a great segment. We've had this added in. We got to even see it a little bit with the uh, TGP. But this segment is powered by Warcraft Logs. If you haven't heard of Warcraft Logs, please go find them, discover them. Uh, you're able to log your dungeons and optimize your gameplay by using their tools to analyze your performance. Level up by learning with archon.gg slash wow. Uh, for more movement maps as well, check out at Warcraft Yaks, who actually inspired this segment with the movement maps that they were creating as well. Uh, this has been a lot of fun, honestly. I don't know. I've liked doing these, Dratnos. I don't know about you. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's great as well, because everybody else in the, on the desk is always so stupid and wrong, and I just <laughs> instantly get the correct one. And then they get to make their dumb arguments about how it's a different boss, and it's great. Yeah, yeah, I love that for you. I love that for you, absolutely. I'm more annoyed <laughs> that he's right. I'm, I'm more annoyed that he's actually I know. right than the fact that he's gloating and patting himself on the back. I'm just more annoyed that he was right and I was wrong. It's brutal. It's brutal. But you know what, Dratnos? I think we, as we've learned, you've done nothing wrong, and we know this. You know everything, and we bow down to you. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us, plebeians. Uh, but we will be sharing more matches with all of you. Our final matchup of the day here in just a few minutes. Our next game will be between Bald Bandits and, come on now, two teams that I think are going to be a real blast to close out our day one of the Group B competition. Uh, we'll see what happens here, hopefully smooth sailing. Maybe we'll even get to the best 
best of three, but you'll have to find out for yourselves. Sit tight until then, and we'll be back in just a few minutes.
Hello and welcome back. This is going to be our last matchup of the Mythic Dungeon International Group B here, our first day. Uh, but Nagra, good to have you back on the desk with us here as we round out the day. How have you liked all of the competition so far? Well, I'm disappointed that I missed the last match because apparently it was very interesting. So <laughs> it was a very eventful series that I missed. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, maybe this one will be just as exciting. Maybe we'll have just as much drama. You know, I think it'll be good. We'll see, we'll see. Uh, but uh, there's been a lot already today that we've gotten to witness with these teams. Uh, all of them coming in, fighting it out, and looking to claim their spot as one of the four that will be going on to the Grand Finals next week. Uh, we have our next competitors here, Bald Bandits versus Come On Now, which will be going into their game one. It looks like they've banned Throne of Tides and Galacron's Fall. Is this about what you were expecting, Dratnos? Yeah, I think... <laughs> I think the Throne of the Tides ban is going to be a very common one on 24 uh, Fortified Bolstering. That that dungeon is going to be a brutal one when we see it, but Everbloom is one that we haven't yet seen today, I don't think. Um, this should be a pretty exciting one. Looks like we're just getting right into it as well. We have our first pull already underway. Both teams operating on the same 4 DPS strategy that we saw pioneered last weekend with that Retribution Paladin as their 4th DPS of choice. We've got a bop for mandatory as they are going to get this set up. Oh, that's not mandatory. Same for sloth as well. Both teams, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. We see the bop um, on the warlock for one team and on the shadow priest for the other team. But look at the damage coming in from mandatory as the double abomination dot goes off and they're taking so incredibly low through this bloodlust. Oh. Did manage to <laughs> yeah. survive though. The team, the team names, of course, have now now been uh, been updated. Yeah, of course, mandatory was last series. I don't know, don't know how I I always get baited whenever whenever our graphics are slow to update, even though I should know better. But yeah, we've got bald bandits and come on now. Of course, our teams here, and we have the gateway into the boss. Basically, the same time as well. This is a pretty close series on paper as well in terms of seeding. I think a lot of us are expecting bald bandits to come out ahead here because this team has a lot of names that you may recognize from some previous MDIs from some top world guilds as well. Uh, but come on now, are absolutely keeping pace, at least at the start of this dungeon. Yeah, they certainly are. And they also pulled a little bit extra enemy forces into that first pool. So not only uh, are they keeping up, they even doing a little bit better, doing a bigger pool at the start, which may or may not save them some time later on. We'll see, depending what gold bandits uh, does to get that extra trash percentage. Might not actually be a downside. As Satsi does go uh, drop. That doesn't go down, but does drop very low from all of that zero damage that's going on in this boss. Now, they do have a lot of interrupts, of course, with that extra um, DPS that they have on the board as well. But three of them being ranged players, meaning they have a little bit of a longer CD on that interrupt, which can be an issue on this boss because there's a lot of um, spam casting going on from those two caster bosses. Yeah, the danger is not too high on the on the 22 keystone level, but it's still quite high. And if somebody just gets targeted by both bosses a couple times, like they're they're going to die and they can die very quickly, very much by surprise. So uh, teams giving them a lot of respect, making sure that they wait to pull the trash until they've got this boss stabilized as well until Gola is dead. Typically, uh, usually on live, you see Telu be the focus uh, because I guess the stun is a bit more of a threatening cast. Actually, I'm not sure why we focus the why we focus Telu on live, but everybody focuses Gola on MDI. Maybe, maybe we should be doing Gola on live as well. Yeah. Hang on, because it's closer to where <laughs> you gateway in, and and either way, once you kill one, the other just starts free casting. So, hang on, that might just be better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, interesting. Should think about this one more time. As Paul Bandits is now moving on, they were the ones finishing off the boss first, and they're actually moving on. Um, to the caster area here, there's a lot of uh, things you have to watch out for. These, these pyromancers, the arcanist ice callers, just casting a lot of dangerous um, spells. If one of them, you probably survive, but if a cinder storm is going through on top of another spell, then it can very easily uh, one shot you from 100 to zero. Also, pyroblast, of course, one of the most dangerous abilities here, or that have to be interrupted for sure. They do have a lot of defense, as you can see, push under warlock using a dark pact and an ending resolve same time making sure he does survive as they're about to spawn the boss and probably pulling it immediately come on now on the other hand also doing the same pull on their side yeah archmage soul of course typically the uh the third boss if you're pulling this dungeon sort of normally but 
the MDI strat usually goes up and around this way. One of the big things that makes this possible is Warlock Gateways, right? Warlock Gateways just let you move around this dungeon uh, so much more freely and let you skip up and back down between Soul and the uh, the Gnarl Root. Or not the Gnarl Root. I guess Gnarl Root is actually in this dungeon. Gnarl Root's what the trash uh, tree, oh, yeah. but uh, Witherbark areas, yeah. All right, Kamana also did uh, manage to engage the boss now. They're also on Archmage. And again, they're slightly ahead in trash percentage, but um, yeah. might or might not actually make yeah, a difference okay. later, we'll see. Uh, especially the Witherbark area is going to be important. Um, I think the last Everblooms we've seen, especially last weekend, we've seen the Witherbark area being the one thing that makes or breaks the routes of these teams. Like, the faster you do that area, um, the you're basically just going to win the dungeon because the rest of the um, the rest of the dungeon is pretty straightforward and all of the teams have been kind of doing the same size pulls. But the Witherbark area is really where uh, you have so much freedom. Are you doing the water strategy? Are you um, playing outside? What kind of trash are you pulling? Are you pulling Gnarl Root? Are you not pulling uh, Gnarl Root? Are you pulling it on top of the boss? There's a bunch of different um, strategies that we've seen from the teams. So I'm interested to see what both... Um, Ball Bandits and Kamana are doing as Ball Bandits are about to Ooh. reach out the boss. And Setsi does go down at the very end, unfortunately. Um, looks like they might not be committing the battle rest and just using an out of combat dress as they're out of combat. That's going to cost a lot of time, though. That's, yeah. you know, five seconds of death timer, ten seconds of rezzing. That's pretty sizable. Like that, that's going to almost erase their lead here. Plus, come on now, have an extra 4% count, too. So, looks like Zatsi going down to. 180k from a melee from a Spiteful Shade as well ended up being the killing blow there, which Spitefuls uh, this season are a little bit less scary than they were in previous seasons because they stopped doing extra damage above level 20, uh, but they're still pretty lethal, although, you know, I think their plan might just be actually to, to let them auto my plate wearers, right? That's, that's usually probably okay, but uh, something that ended up costing them. And that's, uh, we'll see if it ends up mattering, is come on now, are already down, setting up this same pull, and you can see the boss 2 split, come on now, only lost 3 seconds on that split, they actually gained time when you factor in the death and the res, and they're probably only something like 10 seconds behind in total now. Yeah, it's very interesting, because, uh, last weekend as well, I think there was 3 teams who only had 1 second between them as the best run, like, one team was, um... Like 11 11, the other team was 11 10 and 11 12. So that was actually really, really close. Or it was it 10 minutes? I'm not sure. Either way, this dungeon, everything re really matters. So the five seconds staff penalty and the rest actually might uh, come back to bite them in the end. But we'll see. As Witherbark did uh, get engaged for Bald Bandits now, while well, Kamana still waits for that boss to spawn. Looks like they uh, are so seeing some trash and pulling um, Gnarl Root as well on the right side of your screen, while Bald Bandits is also pulling a lot of trash on top of this boss. Yeah, this is a pretty ambitious pull here for Bald Bandits. Come on now, are setting it up as well and are getting into combat a little bit later here. A solid maybe 30 seconds behind and getting the pull started. So Bald Bandits definitely have had a little bit more speed in this area in particular. Looks like they've stabilized the pull as well. Not too much more uh, that could cause them trouble as all that trash is now dead. Witherbark is entering the oh. damage amp phase and hopefully they're able to do... Oh no! They've lost, uh, come on now, I've lost their Warlock. Yeah, actually dying to the Gnarl Root plus some other damage going on um, from the boss. But yeah, Gnarl Root is about to go down for come on now, so they should be able to um, recover. But lost a lot of damage onto the boss as well. You can see Witherbark still very high HP for them. One more thing that is very important for this boss for an MDI run like this is to make sure you stay in that extra damage phase as much as you can. Uh, you can see the ranged players positioning themselves away from the boss, making sure they're looking at where the globules are spawning, and then uh, making sure the roots are in front of the globules, make sure that they're not reaching the boss, otherwise the Witherbark is going to get out of that extra damage phase earlier, and that is not what you want to see on a, a MDI run like this. Looks like Bell Bandits are doing a very good job, though, as that boss has been in this phase uh, forever, almost. While come on now, on the other hand, I did see some of the levels go through. You can see the energy bar at the bottom of your screen, already half energy. Uh, for come on now so they definitely need to make sure that no more globules are going through because they're a little bit behind you need to make sure that that boss stays in this phase as long as possible Ooh, looks like another globule getting pretty low but i think it's going to connect for come on now yes indeed it oh maybe maybe not okay 
So they've still got two more that they can allow in, as Bald Bandits do get the boss killed and are now heading to the end of the dungeon, and there's really not a lot of time here for Come On now. They have to make sure that they don't get this boss out of this damage amp phase, because it's 100% increased damage taken for as long as you can stay in this phase. That is vital. Now there's a line of those globules just running in here, and I think some of these are going to connect. It's going to be hard. It looks like they've actually managed to kill one of them. The other one is connecting, and they just have to make sure that none of these remaining globules get in. I think they're going to be okay, but on the other hand, Bald Bandits are getting their last boss pull underway. I think they're going to be taking some assistance with them through this portal uh, so that they can have a little bit of that count that they need. They do need 6% count. If you're a fan of Come On Now, you're hoping that somehow they only snap 5% in, and uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be the best way back in here. Yeah, I have a feeling they won't be making that mistake as they are now fighting Yalnu and um, of course they need to make sure there's... Oh, there we go, the assistance did snap in. Uh, one of the issues of this, of snapping in general is whenever mobs are snapping longer distances like this, when they're basically teleporting, then they are evading for a little while and it's very difficult or actually impossible to get aggro while they are evading. So you cannot hit the mobs, but the mobs can sometimes still hit good. you. So um, it can be a little bit dangerous whenever you do a strategy like this where you snap mobs on purpose because they might um, aggro the healer or, well, thankfully there is no yeah, healer. Yeah, see? So that's that's, <laughs> that's the nice part. That's why I didn't bring it. <laughs> the person who's going to get the most healing aggro, look at these healing meters, is the tank. So it's actually, <laughs> it kind of works out really nicely. It's the strategy solves itself there with the, uh, with the snap, so... Yeah, looking very, very good as Bald Bandits are now in their Lust. Lust comes off cooldown for Come On now as well. We'll see when they decide to use it. Maybe waiting until they get this ad dead. Oh, unfortunate news for Come On now. They've had a tank go down. Immediate bubble activated by the Paladin. Quick res comes out, but it's not going to be quick enough to save much of the rest of the group. And this is going to be a full wipe for Come On now. Doesn't matter, though. Wouldn't have mattered either way as Bald Bandits are closing the door on this game. Y'all is going to go down, and this is going to be about 11 minutes as well. Quite a quick run out of the Bandits. Quicker than last weekend too, 10.53, while the last best run we had was 11.06, so really well done by Bald Bandit. Big improvement there, Bald Bandit's coming in, while the name might sound new, the team is anything but a uh, big collection of MDI players, uh, as well as you know those who have a lot of experience on the scene, led by MDI winner Fragnance, who has actually won several of those. So again, really experienced on the scene, even though they're running now under a new name. And on the other side, come on now, you know, they, they did it. Come on now, you can keep going. You got to keep pushing it a little bit further, though. And uh, honestly, really exciting for them. They are brand new to the MDI and have been playing together on retail for a while. Now, Tettles, I mean, we, we got to see both of these teams really give it a good showing. But what were some of the observations that you were making as you went through these? So, like you were saying, Bald Bandit's not necessarily a new team. Uh, three out of the five of these players were playing under the name Cheese last season, and they actually just looked really phenomenal. Um, one of the big things I wanted to shout out, though, is like this 4 DPS composition is not easy to pick up, and especially whenever you have people that typically like main healer, being able to swap to that Holy Paladin kind of like overnight is, is something that's uh, a bit challenging. But come on now, it looked incredibly good. Uh, they were actually kind of giving Bald Bandits a run for their money. I think that Bald Bandits just got the better of like the first couple of pulls of the dungeon and leverage that towards basically the entire key's worth of an advantage. Um, but I thought that both teams did a lot of really cool stuff. First and foremost, I think that being able to one-phase Witherbark, that's not an easy feat. And both we, we saw both teams in Come On Now and Ball Bandits being able to one-phase Witherbark. They did a, a great job of dropping those roots just perfectly. And I don't even think they had a Globule contact the boss on the side of Ball Bandits. That's how... Uh, spot on they were with those drops you see kush even there burning rushing to make sure he's getting the double globule and and none of them even contact contact with bark and i thought that this was like a perfect run from ball bandits and if you're any of the other teams watching you kind of have to be worried uh, with what this team is going to kind of present because this first map from ball bandits was great and come on now on the other side also looked very fierce <laughs> Mm -hmm. Bald Bandits, I mean, like you said, they were really staying neck and neck for a lot of it until a few things kind of snowballed towards the end with Come On Now, especially for a first time in the MDI. It's so impressive. But Bald Bandits as well coming in here with this quick run and this fast sweep to take the first game of the match. Uh, of course, there's time for Bald Bandits to turn it around. But I mean, given what we were seeing there, Nagura, do you think that Bald Bandits uh, is going to run away with this one? 
Uh, no, I don't necessarily think so. I think Kamona looked very good in their side as well. Of course, they had some issues at the very end. But up until that point, it looked very close and very competitive between those two teams. So I do think that um, they definitely have a chance to come back into the series. Yeah, I would say there's a good shot. And I mean, Dratnos, we know that coming up next, they're going to be heading into Black Rook. I mean, given what you just saw from the first game, what are kind of your predictions for how this might unfold? Yeah, Black Rook Hold should be a pretty good one, I think, for the series, actually, for both of these teams. Uh, we're not going to have Sanguine. We're not going to have any of that nonsense going on in this one, right? We're, we've got a raging Black Rook Hold, however. And I think the interesting question is going to be, are they going to stick with that 4 DPS strategy that they used in Everbloom? Or are they going to use the 3 DPS that we've seen actually out of, uh, I think even was Perplexed that ran it in their Black Rook. We've also seen 4 DPS. We've seen both in Black Rook Hold so far this weekend. So um, it's an interesting dungeon and, and the the decision is certainly not obvious. So I also want to say, like, for Bald Bandits, uh, Kush mains Rogue. I wonder if they're actually going to, and he's been playing sub most of the season. I wonder if they're going to bust out the sub Rogue for this key. Yeah, the sub rogue, the idea a there is. Player, though, right? I think um, we would want to switch out the priest, is what we have seen. Oh, that's right. a good point. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because So the, the reason that you would like a rogue in Black or Cold, the reason that some teams have used it, is that you can't mount in this dungeon. You have a lot of walking that you have to do. And Shroud, especially as a sub rogue, you can get a movement speed increase on it. So you actually get a nice bit of extra time throughout the dungeon from using those speed shrouds. That's one of the one of the benefits of it. Of course, it also does a lot of, uh, of damage, does some nice priority damage on these bosses, mm -hmm. too. Mm. Yeah, having that uh, extra, you know, edge, right? You're thinking about monopolizing every single second and many classes that have the abilities to let you do that, especially in areas where mounts were not actually implemented in dungeons, right? Uh, we didn't always have them, and not every dungeon is accessible to that kind of mobility. So making use of things like the rogues that we've seen both last weekend and this weekend is a really clever way to try and just monopolize on that time. You know, we're going to have a moment here for Come On Now to be able to come back from this uh, in this next matchup. But, I mean, yeah, we'll have to see what they're running. I mean, is there anything specific from the strats we've seen in dealing with Black Rook that you think they might try to pull off to to get some extra advantage this time around, Tuttles? I don't hate the idea of like 4 DPSing with like an Aug Evoker as your fourth for that that overall soothe. I think that that made a lot of sense from where we saw it earlier. Now, it, it kind of depends on the comp that they've prepared because we've actually seen a lot of different fourth DPS options. We've seen Balance Druid, Aug Evoker, and Rep Paladin. And with the fact that they just kind of flexed in the Rep Paladin for the Everbloom, I think also having them flex into an Aug Evoker would be maybe a little bit weird just for that dungeon if that's what you were practicing. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of different ways that the different compositions can go, but I think the most important thing that you have to watch out for is like the first pull into the boss. That's the part where you see potentially a couple people die, and if two people die, you're not going to have a battle res anymore um, in that first pull, and that's where it really starts to cascade and, and get out of control. Well, we'll be keeping an eye on it here as we come into game two. Black Rook hold Bald Bandits versus Come On Now. Dratnos, let's see what happens with that first pull. Why don't you take it away? Yeah, first pull here. Usually we are expecting a, a pretty similar thing between almost every team. Almost everybody's done this. I would say 98% the same. We will see them run, grab all the trash they can from one of the sides. Uh, the, usually the side with Lady Ilasana, not the, not the Lord side. Take it all onto the boss and then kill it with the boss. Some teams have elected instead to keep that trash CC'd off at the side, which... Uh, depending on what you're doing, potentially if you're not playing a healer as well, that might be something you decide to do. We'll see what those comps end up being as well once the game gets going too. So uh, that is a interesting, interesting thing that we are looking for here. Yeah, then we'll like... see what um, the two teams are going to have as a comp as well. I do believe we're going to see the healer, honestly. I'm not convinced of the Augaboker. Mm. Oh, but the Rogue! There we go. Wow. I didn't want to say this before. Uh, we do, of course, have Drenico and Fragments who are known to be um, able to multi-class a lot. So I was thinking, even though Kush was the one playing the Warlock, it does make sense that Fragments can also play Warlock. Uh, so Drenico playing the Mage, Fragments on the Warlock, and Kush on the Rogue. Very interesting to see that comp being pulled off by Bald Bandits here. As Kamana is sticking to um, a more common comp that we've seen before. 
Yeah, almost five seconds ahead of come on now, Ban ball bandits get to pull the boss. And a lot of that is the advantage of that shroud. Not only does the shroud give you extra movement speed, it lets your group kind of just start running at the, at the beginning and not have to wait for your tank to get threat on mobs because you're in stealth, you're fine. Uh, so you can run through that whole area real quick and uh, they will get, I think, two more total shrouds in this dungeon. So uh, another maybe 10 seconds total of movement speed gained uh, as a result of that. So... You know, that's a nice little benefit. As we have come on now, their tank is so low. Looks like he's going to be able to live with that health pot, not needing to proc cheat death. Wow, those sights as well do a lot of damage. Any two ticks from that I think would kill on this difficulty. Yeah, it definitely looked very dangerous as one of the uh, cheat deaths did proc for uh, Friday. Uh, Culling also procing that uh, cauterize. Rube called um, Ice Cold as well, very... Oh, oh, actually their healer does go down, the boss is almost dead as well as their Warlock goes down too. They might just be waiting for the boss to go down as their Priest follows. They do have a battle rest, but at this point they just have to finish off the boss so everyone can release and make sure that they can finish off this trash. Otherwise it's gonna be a disaster. 1% of the boss as their mage goes down too. There we go, the boss does die and everyone does manage to release. Thankfully their tank managed to survive and pull this one off, but yeah, that could have been a huge disaster. It's still five deaths on the board, but thankfully they managed to recover, so it's uh, not as disastrous as it could have been. Yeah, that was uh, that was something there for come on now. Five deaths on the board. They are still starting the RP only. I mean, it's also bad there. Look at the bottom of the screen. They were 30 seconds slower on that boss dying which means they have to wait 30 more seconds for the door to open. Although I guess the good news for them is that Bald Bandits actually didn't go through the door as soon as it opened, whereas it looks like Come On Now are doing that. They are taking the, the mini boss here with them. And it looks like they did a lot more AoE damage to that pull. So that might just be a thing of having the Shadow Priest instead of the Subtlety Rogue. Uh, maybe that's what was going on there. But yeah, you can see both teams are actually running up the staircase here. Not even that huge of a lead for Bald Bandits, although you have to remember 25 seconds of death penalty coming in for come on now will certainly matter yeah it sure will as bald bandits is now gearing up uh, to do another huge pull on their side it looks like they pulled everything with the patrol even so there's a companion in this one as well uh, that is jumping on players leaving a dot behind you can see uh, on satsi right now on that raster droid as of course afflicted is also an affix that we have in this dungeon so they have to handle that as well you do have multiple dispels if everyone picked up the dispel they do have um, the Raster Druid and the Mage, of course. That's you dropping really low, as there's another bleed from that companion uh, that is that went through, maybe also raging and uh, doing a little bit of extra damage there as well. Come on now, also managed to get up to the same area and is also pulling all of these spiders on top of this double trash pull and also is adding that companion patrol as well. Yeah, it's a, uh, a big, <laughs> big pull going, but... Looks like they're going to be okay so far. We can see for Bald Bandits, actually, they're starting off with Ring of Frost and Sigil of Silence. They're really trying to make sure these mobs are controlled, are grouping together, uh, and they want to be able to save as much as they can. See, the challenge with these pulls on Raging is you want to save your CC for the end of the pull uh, so that you can keep the mobs gripped together and stunned when they're trying to jump out, but you can't use it on them at the end of the pull because of Raging. So uh, it's a, a bit of a nasty affix for this particular set of pulls uh, especially yep definitely very difficult we did see some uh, issues previous teams going down here as either fan of knives went through with raging or we saw some of these arcane blitzes um arcane blasts being cast from the arcanists that uh, eventually are not interruptible anymore um when it's raging as we do see the priest go down again for come on now at the very end of a pool with that raging effect being shot by an archer there by or 330k again these cloth um comps just taking so much physical damage not having that uh, plate armor or any other armor like reducing the damage that you take uh kush on the other hand being a leather player to get a little bit less damage in comparison <laughs> still not the tankiest person against physical damage though yeah at least you got cheat death right or actually yeah. uh, in some high keys they play elusiveness but i would assume it's cheat death for sure in uh in mdi actually i'll pop open the companion to go check that out but looks like Ilizana getting pulled here for bald bandits and this is uh, again ring of frost being used to help get the mobs grouped up under control uh, prevented from doing all their stuff and nice uh, standard pull i think in this area really not too much you can do uh, besides this pull where things are going to start to get crazy is the next pull after this boss that is the big 
hallway that just causes so many problems for teams. A little bit less probably than last week, because last week was Sanguine in here, but uh, still, even with Raging, that, that pull is going to be nasty. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, we did see some teams adapt to this strategy that we've seen last weekend, uh, where the Raster Druid could just kind of stealth ahead before the tank even gathers the whole pool uh, to stop the boulders from spawning down the stairs. So you can use the stairs to um, kite the mobs up, uh, upwards instead of backwards, so you're not backtracking. And also just saving some time later on, so when the rest of the group walks up the stairs, you don't have to dodge those boulders. We'll see if Bald Bandit is doing that as well. Of course, last time with uh, Sanguine, it was a lot more efficient uh, because you had to kite the mobs a lot in comparison to these week's affixes because you don't necessarily have to kite uh, with Raging and Fortified unless the tank is in trouble. So we'll see what they're going to be doing. As come on now, now down to 37% on Illusana. Managed to catch up a little bit after all of those issues that they had on the previous trash, but still uh, quite a bit behind. They need uh, some catching up to do as the gateway for Bald Bandits has already been put down that they immediately are using to save some time here. And now we'll see if Yip gathers up everything, if Satsi uh, walks ahead. And it does look like Satsi is making his way up the stairs to stop the boulders on the right side of yeah, that's a, a good strategy there. Ooh, they also, because they have the rogue, oh, yeah. Kush can tricks a bunch of stuff to Yip, and they're able to uh, get everything into this room here and then group it all together. Nice way of, uh, of getting this pull started just a little bit quicker. These sorts of little optimizations, where you're moving, how the mobs are moving, feel less important than stuff like DPS, but if you're able to save three seconds by getting a pull started sooner, that's a lot of DPS, effectively, yeah. uh, and that is big for the Bald Bandits. They're trying to make sure that they keep these mobs CC'd as much as possible so that they, from 30 to 0, are just casting the drink rather than casting their uh, their spin or their indigestion, any of those abilities. And it looks like they've done a textbook job of it over on the left-hand side. Bald Bandits just taking care of that and now heading up the staircase that they've already finished the Boulder RP on as well. I mean, this is going so great for Bald Bandits. They are looking so good in this series. Come on now, are not far behind, though, especially given how disastrous that first boss was. You know, you can see on the bottom of the screen, come on now actually saved a bunch of time on their boss 2 split, largely by pulling uh, that first pull of the split much faster, more quickly together, uh, a much faster chain pull than Bald Bandits. So uh, come on now, are able to actually get maybe a little bit of time back, but they're going to have a death here to indigestion. And yeah, Bald Bandits just have a huge opportunity here to slam the door. Yeah, they are now on a smash fight with those dominators that are pulled on top. They didn't pull all of the dominators usually um, in the MDI. They're skipping some of them, making sure they don't need to interrupt more than two dominators, because otherwise you might be running out of interrupts for those foul frenzies. But still, those dominators doing a decent amount of damage to a tank on top of uh, smash fight also not being uh, something to scoff at whenever it comes to tank damage. So it looks like the team, uh, the rest of the team is helping out the with the hateful gazes, soaking some of these frontals, especially Kush, of course, on the rogue, being able to have uh, to soak multiple of those uh, with defensives. Yeah, a lot of options there. The um, the rogue. So when rogues are playing outlaw, they can basically just get back to uh, evasion every single time. Uh, when they're playing other specs, they don't really get to do that, but uh, they can still press evasion once and soak another one naturally. So a lot of uh, a lot of value there. Of course, you've got a bunch of other people that can soak them as well in this group, and you don't have to do it for very long because the boss does die pretty quickly. But come on now, we're also getting started with the fight here. They are, yeah, may maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half behind, maybe two minutes when you factor in that death difference. So they are at the point where they need Bald Bandits to wipe. Uh, but... There is always that possibility. We'll see how aggressively Bald Bandits want to pull this. Usually teams just take this all the way upstairs into the uh, into the last boss. Looks like they're setting up to do just that. They actually don't even get a second shroud or third shroud this dungeon. It's going to be a two shroud dungeon for Bald Bandits. It's in fact barely going to be a two lust dungeon for them with how quickly they've been moving through here. Still 30 seconds before lust is available. As on the side of come on now, we have a bit of a disaster unfolding. Cauterized yeah. proct for their mage followed by a death on the tank. The res is going to land. And they're going to be kiting for a little while here as the tank tries uh, to reestablish threat. But yeah, it's a fell frenzy issue. As soon as you have deaths, fell frenzies are going off as well. I mean, it is just catastrophic 
and come on now are going to be wiping it to smash bite that means it will all come down to whether or not bald bandits can kill this boss if they can do that if they can stay clean here uh, they will be in tremendous shape for the rest of this weekend for earning one of those four slots out of the group. Come on now, won't be eliminated just yet. Even if they lose here, they'll go into the lower bracket tomorrow where they'll be fighting for their lives all day. But Bald Bandits are, uh, I mean, they're just looking so, so good here. Again, zero deaths. Hitting, ooh, actually hitting the Lust as soon as Dantalianax spawns here. Uh, interesting time to press that button. Um... I think it's certainly for the difficulty of the raging lances and swordsmen here, okay. I believe, before the buff is out. Making sure they can finish those off before any kind of disaster happens with the Ooh, hit and them jumping around with any kind of swarmers being out. So, yeah, I think maybe a little bit of a safety play here. Uh, one thing to... Oh, wow. Are they going to be able to kill it before it casts Dreadlord's Guile? Is that the idea here? Do they have the damage for that to just one phase the boss? That's what they're going for here. And they've wow. done it. Oh, my goodness. What on oh earth God. did we just see? <laughs> what? what was that? <gasps> that was incredible is what that is. And it secured the victory for Bald Bandits here, taking both of their games. I mean, that was pretty incredible. One phasing there at the end. Bald Bandits playing so clean, even though Come On now tried their hardest to stay in there and to catch up where they could. Those wipes just made it so that it wasn't going to happen. But I mean, Tettles, that was pretty wild there at the end. I, I think that finish was actually super extraordinary from Bald Bandits. I think everything else that they did looked, you know, fairly standard. I thought they got great usage out of that speed shroud. It's kind of something we were talking about earlier. Uh, basically, what, what happens is like Shroud in Darkness, which is a talent that's only available to sub rogues, gives you 100% movement speed uh, once that shroud is applied to you. And historically, people would use like Lightfoot or like Skystep potions to increase their movement speed in a dungeon like this. However, you know, bald bandits really utilizing that sub rogue to its best potential. And sub rogue on top of that is just like a great spec at doing AOE damage. Uh, on the other side, come on now. This was the pull that I was kind of talking about before we like cut to the game, where this pull can just go so wrong so fast. The counselors are casting on you. If you have the retainers, you know, putting up those bleeds and you get sniped by a counselor, very quickly you can have five deaths, which is what we saw from uh, this team here. And then for the Bald Bandits, they just kind of took control at the first boss and never really relinquished it. And the ending with that, beating the boss before the Dreadlord's Guile, that, that is like an insane amount of boss damage that I didn't really know was possible. <laughs> As we all sit here in silent stuns, like, yeah, that was, no, it was pretty incredible, honestly. I mean, literally sitting here, what a perfect way to end day one of at least our second weekend, our Group B competitors. I mean, absolutely phenomenal there, pushing that in one phase, like, nothing saves time, like, just one facing the boss, <laughs> being able to just take them out immediately and just wrap it up. I mean, fantastic play from them, and I think that we absolutely can say that bald bandits although the name might be new these veterans are here and they are ready to absolutely throw down and earn their place in the grand finals i mean absolutely incredible dratnos we saw a lot of fantastic plays today a lot of strong teams coming out uh but like where's your mind right now as we're coming through day one with group b yeah i mean this was just a unbelievably uh high high octane day it's crazy as well because a lot of these series ended up being two i mean actually yeah they, i guess three of the series ended up being two o's but there was a lot of competition here today and i think tomorrow both our upper and lower bracket games are going to be so hotly contested because i mean even our lower bracket teams like yeah there were a lot of these a lot of these wipes came in today for teams that lost but Aside from those, they were looking really solid and really uh, really fast in a lot of these dungeons compared to what we've seen in previous MDIs out of our lower seeded teams. So uh, I think we're going to be in for just a really good day tomorrow. Yeah, and uh, I mean, this is the third time we saw Black Rock Hole today, which is very interesting. Like, usually we see uh, some dungeons, like we see a variety of dungeons on the first day, and then the other teams don't have too much time to, like, um, compare strategies to one another. And there's more of like a strategy stealing going on from uh, one team to the other, and they maybe like keep some of their strategies to themselves. But seeing uh, Black Rock Hole three times today, the fastest time was actually still perplexed from the very first series at 11.16, and then Bald Bandits with 11.19, just three seconds slower uh, 
uh, on their side, and then 1137 uh, as well. So like a lot of teams very close to each other in Black or Cold. And uh, so I think these teams are going to go back into that dungeon, look at what the other teams are doing, and really refine their strategy for tomorrow, because they have a lot of footage to go through. <laughs> There's definitely a lot of prep. We even saw that with the first weekend, as a tall looked like it was going to be sub nine. Suddenly, everybody was practicing a tall that night, trying to streamline it, trying to see how quick they could make it. And here are teams that we can see on our brackets. Of course, we have in the upper brackets, Perplexed and Eclipse will be facing off Mandatory and the Bald Bandits, and then down in our lower brackets, which we will also be hitting tomorrow. Bone Buds Resurrected versus Ducks Can Fly and Sloth versus Come On. Now, all of these teams are going to have to be taking a look at what they can do to help shorten and, and lessen that gap, shorten their runs, and really get in this competition. Now, of course, the lower brackets have just as much of a chance to make it up to the top four that will be progressing ahead to our grand finals, though tomorrow the eliminations officially begin. So everything is on the line for those in the lower bracket, while those in the upper bracket have a few more chances to really secure their spots. And of course, we will also be looking to crown a champion as well for our second week, which is just, you know, I think a good feeling as you come into the grand finals. But after what we saw today, I mean, Tettles, what are your thoughts for how the rest of the competition is going to shake out this weekend? I, I think consistency is probably the most important thing um, across this weekend. We we saw Cup A, uh, we saw like the introduction to all of the, the major and key strats that teams needed to know. Now Cup B is typically going to be, can these teams refine these core strats that we saw from Cup A? And then they need to make sure that they are done nearly perfectly. Um, and, and honestly, Dratnas, if I were you, I'd feel pretty good after seeing Perplexed, where Mandatory looked like they had a couple of hiccups. Perplexed looked unfazed the entire day. Yeah, I mean, this team is really, really, really good. I, Mandatory is really good, too. I get why you guys all put, it, put them in, uh, <laughs> in first. But Perplexter, I mean, they are such a powerful roster. And I think they added Ze Zevi. This, uh, this time is the first time that he's playing for them in MDI, which yeah. uh, that's, you know, world first Raider. Very powerful addition to the roster here. So... I'm I'm excited for this team. I think they're I think they've got a good chance of not just taking this group, but potentially even taking global finals. It's a team that has looked really good in the past a lot, and a lot of us have been baited in the past as well because they've they've had a lot of time trials where they've come out in first, and then they've had disappointing actual weekends of play. But I don't know, I think I think this is it. I think this is the time where they finally put it all together. It's insane that you say baited in when they consistently come in second or third every single time. <laughs> well, there were there was a global no, finals where they went out in like sixth or, or yeah. eighth or something. Which okay, was, that, was, uh, that was that one time. The that was one yeah. time. <laughs> Everybody gets their one time of just That's goofing true. it, okay? You know, <laughs> just once, once. We've all been there. <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, these teams are so competitive, and all of them, I think, you know, we had our predictions, but it's been amazing to see how this has kind of actually come together here on the first day. What maybe we're thinking, like, hey, yeah, that absolutely, Perplex is looking so good. Maybe we should have all made Perplex our number one. But mandatory as well, I mean, really bringing some great runs and showing why they're such a powerhouse. Um, of course, many other teams, too, jumping in here to show what they're made of. I mean, Nagura, you had your predict uh, predictions. Do you feel like anything has changed after seeing today? Yeah, I mean, it's the first day. I think there's still a lot that can happen. Uh, sometimes it's also true that on the first day, a team performs really well and another not so much. And then the next day, it completely switches around, right? Uh, that is also something that can happen. But seeing the teams today, I would also put Perplex in first, in a mandatory second. And I think I would also put the Bald Bandits over Eclipse as well. Um, if, in hindsight, like after today. I don't want to change my predictions, of course. I don't think I would even be able to, but... <laughs> uh, but I do think that tomorrow might still be different. Yeah, don't ask Dratnus how he changed his predictions last week. Yeah, <laughs> Whoa, that's what I was going to say. I was going to call Dratnus <laughs> out. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's not finalized until oh. you know, until the Dratos, weekend's over, man. Really? Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> it's not Look. finalized until the actual winner has been declared. Until yeah, yeah. I'm happy with it, you know. <laughs> it's so weird though, because Dratnos, I feel like I remember earlier you saying that you're never wrong about anything. So I yeah, mean... the secret to that is just changing your answer after the fact. <laughs> Interesting strategy.
strategy. Interesting strategy. Some unique uh, tech you've developed there when it comes to predictions here. Uh, but I mean, we've got a lot more ahead of us this week and hopefully more unique tech that we'll be seeing in the runs themselves too. Uh, tomorrow, we will be back live with all of you. I'll be hosting. We'll have all of our amazing analysts and commentators as well. And we will be going through the upper and lower brackets where eliminations will happen. And we will see our top four who will be heading towards being determined for the grand finals. Of course, on Sunday, we will have our actual throwdown and we'll have our champion for Group B decided. But every single day is bringing the action and we hope that you will be there to witness it. Tomorrow, we will be live, same time, same place, 10 a.m. PT, 12 p.m. CT, 7 p.m. CEST. You know, if you've got a time converter, figure it out, but we'd love to have you. We'd love to see you and we'd love to experience more of the Mythic Dungeon International with all of you. It's been a great day, but until tomorrow, everyone, uh, get some sleep and we'll see you bright and early or middle day-ish for some more Mythic Plus action.